Okay, everybody, um, welcome uh, to the British Region Convention. This is day five of our convention. Um, we've had clinics and make and take clinics and all kinds of things all through the week. And uh, tonight we've got four clinics from uh, clinicians from the UK. Um, we'll we'll do each one. They're not all quite an hour. Um, we're up with Mike Arnold first for an hour, and then we've got a 30-minute clinic, then a one-hour clinic, then a 30-minute clinic. Um, we're streaming this from, from a piece of software called WebEx. It's the first time we've done this. Um, things may or may not go well, but we'll do our best. And if you can just bear with us, it's not quite as slick as what we normally use, but um, hopefully uh, this should all work. So I will introduce our first clinician for the evening. It's going to be Mr. Mike Arnold. As always, um, if anyone's got any questions, if you're in this, if you're part of the British region in our WebEx call, then put them in the chat. If you're watching us on uh, YouTube or Facebook, good afternoon in the US, good morning in, in Australia, and good evening to the folks in the UK. Ask your questions as you go. At the end, I will uh, put all of your questions to uh, to Mr. Arnold. So, Mike, over to you. Thank you. Let's hope we can get this on the road. Okay. We just have the grey. We just yeah. We just have the grey box as usual with, with, okay. with cameras. Yeah, yeah, with you. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah with do it, your yeah. usual. Yeah. Get it up. Get out of the way. Get yep. rid of that. That's great. There we go. Okay. Um. Yeah. I I can see from those participating. Some of you have done this. You you have planned the trips. I've been party to uh, what we've organised. So. Um, I'm going to concentrate on what I've done, what works, uh, what doesn't work. Um, I, Canada's an afterthought, and as you'll see, I, I refer everybody to Terry Wynn if, if you need advice on Canada. Here we go again. Sorry. Oh, come on. Here we go. Um, what I should look at, not, not necessarily in this order, but you know, where do you start to plan any rail fanning holiday to the US? Um, a major deliberation is going to be whether you do a road trip or a rail trip. And to be fair, I hadn't really considered rail trips until I went to Kansas City in 2018. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's a major deliberation. Um, Hotspots. There are lots of them. Um, I can only speak to those in the west, west of the Mississippi. Um, there are many in the east. I don't have experience of them, but nonetheless, I shall refer to them. And there will be details of some of the hotspots you could look at. Um, you know, what are the reasons for going? I mean, some people, it's tourist railroads, it's steam, it, it's heritage stuff. Um, also, there are some language difficulties. Despite your best efforts, they will still think in certain states you come from Australia. Um, so there are some tips from you know for, for a, a successful trip. And at the end of the day, you want to ask some questions. As Gordy said, you've got the chat facility, but also at the end there'll be some hopefully a slot for, for questions. So how it all started for me. USA interest was a trip to Disney in 92. Um, they've got their own railroad. But I had a member of our club used to hammer on about the great things in the States, the Tehachapi Loop, for example, the, um, the Keddy Y. Anyway, a friend of mine in 94 said, when you're there, could you buy me the latest Walther's kit for an auto rack car? So I did. I bought him a kit. I took it back to the UK. Also bought myself a China clay um, funnel flow as well. 94 went back again and I bought myself a tunnel motor. Now everybody knows what my email address is. So this is, you know, my, my favorite locomotive. No doubt about it. That's how it all started. Much the same time, there was this huge hoarding 
on Adelaide House on the north side of London Bridge. And it was this one, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101. You know you're in Marlborough country. That's how it read. You know you're in you know, America when you get a freight train going across your uh, grade crossing like that. Um, oddly enough, I found a, a video on YouTube recently. Uh, I think it was somewhere on the um, uh, Arizona, uh, former SP, now UP track, where I counted 216 well cars in a consist. Absolutely phenomenal. That would have taken 20 minutes to go past the average speed. It was a mile and a half long. Absolutely enormous. That made an impact on my thinking about US. Um, quick gallop through what are the class one railroads in US and Canada. Um, I apologize if your railroads not mentioned. Um, when I started, Southern Pacific was a major railroad player. It's not anymore. Denver and Rio Grande was a class one railroad. It's not anymore. Things do change. Class two railroads, like sort of regionals, there are some that stand out. Genesee and Wyoming, for example. Has anyone seen a freight liner train recently in the UK? It's in Genesee and Wyoming colors. Um, these are some of the others. I mean, Florida East Coast, um, it, it runs literally down the east coast of Florida. It, it, it's quite an operator. These are the major players in the regional marketplace. Okay, so if you're planning or thinking of, of a trip to the US to do some rail fanning, there are three issues you need to think about. Plan, plan, plan. It's like location, location, location. You're moving house. It's no different. You there's, there's no limit to how much you can plan. The more you plan, the better your trip will be. So if you're planning a trip, what are the facets? Be honest. What are you going for? Is it just train watching? Is it riding the trail, the rails, Amtrak? You want to see some steam? some old heritage diesel? Is it the museums? Is it tourist locations thrown in? I've done many a trip with my wife and we've combined the two. Is it a convention? Well, that's probably what appeals to most of us. Can we organize a trip to the US around a convention somewhere that actually piques my interest in, in US railroading? Hobby shops, you know, to what extent you want to buy fill those carrier bags to go home with. Or a road trip. Now, I, I cannot recommend this enough. Um, Route 66 is one you can actually hit upon quite easily and enjoy a lot of railroading to boot. Is it the scenery? Um, there's a lot of it in the US, mountains, desert, quite extremes. Or is it all of the above? Um, you have to decide you have to make a, a list of things you want to achieve from your trip. So is it road trip versus rail trip? Road trip, these are my photographs. This is you know, Monument Valley. This is the classic view. No cars on the road to the east of Monument Valley in, uh, I guess, it was Arizona. I'm not sure. It may have been Colorado or New Mexico. Four Corners is not very far from where Monument Valley is. Or on the right, the rails. Um, I cannot recommend Amtrak enough. This is the approach to the Mississippi Rail Crossing taken from the rear window of the Southwest Chief. Make a list of what you want to do. Is it rail, rail trip or road trip or a bit of both? Work out where you want to start where you want to end. Is it out and back or is it a one way? What are your must sees? What if you're with other people? What are the tourist traps? If you're with your other half, what does she want to see? What does he want to see? What do you want to see? 
Grand Canyon may be one of those lifetime trips you want to make in Arizona. Shopping, not just for model railroad stuff. Yeah, I know, if you're in Colorado, Caboose Hobbies is always the place to go. But there are quality model railroad shops in most major cities in the US. Plus, you've got shopping malls, get those jeans at a quarter of what you pay for home here, etc. Do you want to do some relaxing and chilling? You know, where do you want to be? Sunshine? Do you want a, a pool somewhere? Do you want to do some wine tasting? Uh, yeah, we've been to the Napa Valley, my wife and I. We've amalgamated the whole thing. It works quite well. But drink sensibly, please, if you're driving. And accommodations. Now, I'll mention this once and once only. Most American hotels have rooms which are twins. They are queen size beds, two queen size beds. So everything in multiples of two works efficiently. So don't look for odd numbers. It will look quite odd if three of you book a twin room. Expect certain suggestions at breakfast time. And finally, be prepared to compromise. It's almost like buying a house. You have your list of things you're looking for, but sometimes they can't all be achieved. Work out what your priorities are and what you have to be prepared to give up on. Now, this is an example, uh, and Derek Murphy, who's online here, will, will empathize totally with this. This is what broadly our agenda was. We were heading to the Modern Railroad NMRA convention in Kansas City in 2018. So we flew to Chicago. We got a great deal with Norwegian. We flew premium and we got there cheaper than it would be for most airlines flying direct to Kansas City. We rented a car for two days. There's a logic to it because we went rail fanning at Dalton Junction, south of Chicago. We spent a full day there plus half a day on the, the third day. On the third day, we headed back to the airport, handed the car in, got the uh, metro system into the center of Chicago, and in the afternoon, we took the Southwest Chief to Kansas City. An absolutely fabulous experience. Days four to eight, it was a convention. We did all the things on the agenda. We booked um, tours. We did our own thing. We had the, we, we, we actually ultimately hired a car and went down to Santa Fe Junction on more than one occasion. And finally, at the end of the week, we had the model train show, which, okay, it's on for three days, Friday through Sunday. Friday morning, you get totally exclusive NMRA access. Um, we were there all day Friday, all day Saturday, and on Sunday, we bailed, we checked out, we hired another car, and we hit the road. And we went for a fun road trip, although, in hindsight, it was probably too much. We went as far as Colorado and then headed back to Chicago. It was a fun trip. We planned it. We booked all the hotels. We knew exactly where we were going on which day of the week. Um, that's just one idea of what you can do. Um, people can start thinking about um, Santa Clara next year in the Bay Area or St. Louis in 2022. Subject, of course, to COVID-19 and all the restrictions that that may or may not apply. So, if you're going to a national, what are the key issues? Santa Clara. You can think about it's a San Francisco Bay Area. You want to do a road trip before or after? Now, I can only say, in my experience, I went to Santa, uh, sorry, Sacramento in 2011, and our trip involved flying into Seattle and flying home from San Francisco. So we actually had a road trip before, but you know, it's work out what you want to be and where you want to be. It's going to be, I think, July the 4th to the 11th. So July the 4th, interesting concept. They celebrate independence from the United Kingdom. Um, 
you could say the red coats were banished, but actually I regard it as a bit of a damp squid. Only last year in uh, Salt Lake City did I see any reasonable celebrations of Independence Day. The Sacramento in 2011, we were there. There was hardly a firework in the sky. Um, so, so much for uh, celebrating independence. St. Louis 2022, well, it's a major hotspot in itself. Um, you could take the Amtrak from Chicago and take a road trip after. That's broadly what we did in Kansas in 2018. It's not a million miles away. It's a seven hour train journey up the, up the, I think which river, Missouri River, I think, from St. Louis to Kansas. You can take a train. So it's not a, you know, a million miles away. In 2023, it's in Grapevine, Texas. Um, no one's probably heard of Grapevine. There's actually a, a tourist railroad there. It's not far from uh, the Fort Worth, Dallas-Fort Worth area. So um, you've got a lot of you know, railroad action there, Tower 55 and all that. Um, but remember, Texas is an extremely big state and there's a lot of nothing before you get anywhere. So I'm not entirely sure you might want to try to, to plan a, 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 a rail planning trip around Grapevine unless it involves Texas locations. And of course, Texas abuts the Mexico border. There's no knowing what the next US uh, jurisdiction will have in relation to Mexico. You could ride the rails. Um, you've got lots of options. Obviously, there's Amtrak, which is largely transcontinental. And you can pick and choose how far along that route you want to go. For example, we took the Southwest Chief from Chicago to Kansas. We had a coach allocated at the back of the train, which was a Kansas City passengers train. Um, you can get off. No doubt it became, if it was still attached to the train, it became something from Kansas to, I don't know, somewhere farther east, farther west, sorry. Um, but you can pick and choose on that um, uh, route how far you go. It's not a case of staying the whole length. Local passengers, including the Northeast Corridor, is very popular. The Bay Area has Caltrans and Amtrak, California. There's LA's Metrolink, Utah's front runner. I enjoyed that last year in Salt Lake City between, um, I think, a range of places now. But anyway, it runs up. You can get a ticket. You can enjoy it the whole day long. Chicago's Metro, very, very intensive commuter service. There's light rail in a lot of American cities, which are very useful as well. And of course, you've got tourist and heritage railroads right the way across America. It's not quite the same density as ours in the UK, but they have an awful lot, as you will see. Um, Amtrak, you can book online. Um, there are lots of destinations. All the trains have names. If it's a long enough train, some are three to four, no, sorry, two to three days in duration. So you have sleeping accommodation. The lounge car is something else. This is an illustration to the right. Um, I, I know Derek didn't wander far from his seat, but I did. I went to the bar to get some snacks, even though we'd had lunch in the dining car, a, a dinner in the dining car. But in the lounge car, there's a, there's a bar downstairs, but actually upstairs, you've got this sort of um, panoramic view with swivel seats, and you could be anybody. You could have a real chat with complete strangers. Um, however, there's one downside to Amtrak. You can be extremely delayed by freight trains. Don't forget you're riding on BNSF, UP, Norfolk Southern, or CSX trails. And here's a sort of a, an overview of the Amtrak network um, across the USA. Um, everything seems to emanate from Chicago, which is, yeah, it, it's a city of railroads. Um, top line there, you have the Empire Builder. Next line down is California Zephyr, then the Southwest Chief, and so on. But let's have a look at what's recommended by the Americans. USA Today, one of the most popular um, rags in the USA, 
had 10, and it's quoted the Coast Starlight, Seattle, Los Angeles service is the best. Empire Builder, just touched upon that, across the top. California Zephyr, Chicago to Bay Area via Denver. The Southwest Chief. The Grand Canyon Railway, an independent railroad. The Durango and Silverton Railroad. The Cumbus and Toltec. The Alaska Railroad. Amtrak's Adirondack on the east from New York to Montreal and the Cass Scenic Railroad. A number of my contacts in the NMRA have suggested Cass as one of the places to go and see. And if you like, in summary, six of those are public railroads, and four of those are heritage railroads, tourist railroads. So not a bad mix at all. So, you know, identify those, think about which ones you'd like to take, to get to your destination or to enjoy after your holiday, your vacation. And let's not forget Canada. And you've got the Canadian, which runs cross country. Or the Rocky Mountaineer, which has three different routing. They all have titles according to their website, Journey Through the Clouds, First Passage to the West and Rainforest to Gold Rush. Um, you know, those, those are the real main alternatives. Of course, you could always ask Terry Wynn. Um, he's a real expert. I know he's taken Rocky Mountaineer. And I do recall he mentioned taking the Canadian and it was stopped somewhere en route because of some Native American or Native Canadian uh, protest about um, circumstances in their particular part of Canada. And he had to de detrain. I mean, here's the route of the Canadian. Um, I just love the fact it goes to Sioux Lookout um, sounds extremely primitive and harping back to the uh, 19th century, I think. Saskatoon, uh, the state of Saskatchewan, the home of potash. Uh, but then you get into the interesting parts of the, the Rockies to Jasper, you know, after Edmonton to Jasper, Kamloops, and into Vancouver. And here's a route of the one of the Rocky Mountaineers. Um, all very scenic, um, all very attractive, and many of these are actually attached also to cruises that operate um, up the west coast of America, either the Alaska cruises or the cruises up to Vancouver, uh, and you can add on rail tours. Um, if you're thinking about hotspots, um, you know, where would you like to go? There is actually a Calm Back publication. You've got the internet to look at. There are various websites I would recommend. And I'm going to provide Gordy with a handout, which gives all these um, website locations. Um, I have to say that many of my um, research was done in the early years using SPV, steam powered video, um, based in uh, Kent for their videos, which are all reproductions of US produced videos different locations across the US, including Calmback's hotspots. You've got publications like Trains Magazine, Railfan, and, yeah, and so on. Or just go from word of mouth. You know, what do people recommend? I can recall someone said to me, you must go to Vancouver. And you always think of British Columbia. No, it's Vancouver, Washington State, a different city altogether. It does work. And maps, the lawn maps are an absolute must. If you've got a car and you want to get from A to B and get there quickly and spot the railroad locations. Also, SPV used to produce, I'm not sure they still produce, books by Mike Walker, which detailed the railroads by state in that particular part of the US. <clears throat> So if you're planning to go to any of the upcoming conventions, you know, what, what might you do? Um, don't forget, Santa Clara is on, on the, the edge of the, the San Francisco Bay Area. So think about a road trip before or after. Do you want to hit some of the railroad hotspots on the way to San Francisco, on the way home from San Francisco? Um, St. Louis. Um, Direct flights are hard to come by, 
So you might want to think about flying to Chicago, taking the Amtrak from Chicago and taking a road trip afterwards, well, like our trip to Kansas City two years ago. Um, Grapevine in, in Texas, um, as I say, Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, it's a long way to go to get to any, anywhere else. Houston is southeast of um, Dallas-Fort Worth, another great location for trains. But as I say, beware the Mexican border to the southwest of there. Um, getting in and getting out, I, I don't know. I never tried it, but it could be more difficult to get back in having left. And certainly don't think about taking a hire car over the border. So you might want to do your own thing. Um, I have. I mean, I've been to Colorado and, and designed my own trip with and without my wife, with other rail fan colleagues. You've got narrow gauge trains. You've got scenic main lines up through the Moffat uh, Tunnel or down the, the joint line. You've got the Model Railroad Museum up at Greeley. You've got the State Railroad Museum at Golden. New England, I've not really explored, but there's so much. There are so many tourist railroads. Pennsylvania, you've got Horseshoe Curve. You've got Steamtown. There are other hotspots in Pennsylvania, all on the East Coast. You've also got the Strasbourg uh, Railway, which apparently they claim to be the longest operating without cessation railway company in the Western Hemisphere. It's like 1830 something. And the South, deep South, you've got a lot of railroad hotspots. You've got lots of tourist railroads and you've got theme parks. You want to go as far as Florida. Now, Santa Clara, I've given this some thought because clearly as Atlantic District Director, I have to go, but subject to COVID-19, this is what you might want to think about. It's San Francisco. Caltrans runs a very, very intensive service around the Bay Area on both sides of it. You've also got BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit. And on that, you can use the Muni card within San Francisco, which you can use on BART, you can use it on the cable cars, you can use it on buses, and you can use it on the street cars. Sacramento's only 120 miles away. You've got the California State Railroad Museum. The old town is worth visiting. It's right next to, or in, the museum is in the old town. Roseville Yard is only about 10 miles northeast from downtown Sacramento. And beyond that, you've got Donna Pass. If you want to do some tourist stuff, you've got Napa and Sonoma, wine growing areas to the north, Monterey to the south, Yosemite to the east. Yosemite, I have to say, is like the Garden of Eden. It is a stunning national park. And here's a, just a, a, a view of the Bay Area public transport system. Um, Santa Clara is down at the bottom, San Jose area. San Francisco, you can see probably two thirds of the way up. Um, yeah, it, it's got BART that links across the bay, across to Oakland. So the whole area is completely smothered in a transportation system. So getting about is not an issue. So railroad hotspots from the Santa Clara base. Um, I took this photograph many years ago at Needles, California. Uh, one of my pals who's no longer with us, uh, former NMRA member Pete Laxton at Needles. We were sat outside the crew change point there one evening in 110 degrees of heat. Uh, we were enjoying ourselves and so were you. The California, if that blue spot is Santa Clara, here are some of the locations. Roseville Yard, 120 odd miles away to the northeast. Donna Pass, just beyond that, it's a section of line that runs from Roseville up over the Sierra Nevadas over into Nevada. Stockton Tower, it's just here to the south. Yeah, it's a major hotspot. However, it's in pink because I caution you, 
that this is not a particularly nice area to be. It's not entirely safe. I, I've never spent any time there. And if I did, I wouldn't feel very secure. It's just a rough area. It's a down. It's very much the wrong side of the tracks in Stockton. The Hatchery Mountains. Um, <clears throat> if you've never seen mountain railroading, this is the place to go. Yet the loop takes all the, the plaudits, but it is such a scenic place to go. And because the trains are going uphill at slow speed, you can chase a train from the bottom to the top and see it three or four times and get set up for camera shots without any difficulty at all. The home pass, more on the LA side of things. Um, it, it's sort of northeast of LA. Again, fabulous location for trains. You will, unless there's MOW possession on any of the three tracks, you will always see trains. The Needle Sub at the Mojave Desert, it parallels the old Route 66, National Trails Highway, as they call it. Again, one of my old favorite locations to see and chase trains. So let's have a look at this place in a bit more detail. Roseville, there's actually a pavilion where you can sit under cover and watch trains coming in at the north end of Roseville Yard. Or you can take one of the streets down the side and get pretty close to the action. Or the, deep, the depot and the um, diesel facility. And they sometimes park redundant stock. These were all units going into lease fleets parked down the western side of Roseville Yard. Donna Pass, absolutely dramatic scenery. You're talking high altitude, not particularly high when compared with, uh, say, Colorado, but very, very dramatic. It's at Uber Pass. This is Donna Pass, a train coming out of Tunnel 41. The big hole, as they call it, under Mount Judah, right at the very top of the pass. And this is a train waiting to go into that very same tunnel. The Hatchapi, I've mentioned that already. And if you look very carefully at the locomotive and look to the left of it, you'll see some bulkhead flats. Those are part of the same train. It is coming down into Bealeville, another great location. It goes around a canyon off to the right. And to the left, we have the loop. It's actually called Walong, Waylong. It's named after Mr. W. A. Long, who was a surveyor of the Southern Pacific who surveyed the line and created this particular engineering feat. And that locomotive coming out there is hauling those cars you see above it. And this is Caliente, another fabulous location in Tehachapi. Um, not this time the same train, but this train, the UP one's in the hole waiting for the BNSF intermodal train to come down the hill and clear the single track line down from Bealeville. This is at the loop on top of the loop. This is one of the tunnels leading down to Caliente, Tunnel 2, another great location. You can get pretty close to the action without trespassing. Home Pass. Um, this has got uh, a tourist location, a rail fan location. Um, I'm sure it's very, very unofficial. It's called Hill 582, or 58.2 is the milepost. Um, it's been created by rail fans. It has shade trees, and it looks out over the tracks. And you get this fabulous view halfway up the pass of trains going up on the left, and coming down on the right. Um, to be fair, the view of the SP trains on that track is uh, somewhat dated. It's 1998, all gone now into history, of course. Blue Cut coming up to one of the first locations, but seen from where Route 66 parallels the rail tracks up through the pass. And Again, from Hill 582. And here at Summit, 
it has changed somewhat since I was last there. There are now three tracks from here. When you have a chance on an overlook to see trains coming up to Summit and, of course, going down the hill. But you can actually look down on the trains and see the detail of locomotives for modelling purposes. An SD 45T-2, now in ownership of the UP. A C40-8 CSX. Interesting to see how they've arrayed their um, antennas. And an old um, C40-8 and a more modern C40-8 standard cab, again with its array on the roof. To the east of that, you've got the Mojave Desert, the Needles subdivision. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful location. Um, I, I've got some caveats on the heat of the West later on. But yeah, some fabulous locations. But California is a host to a number of great tourist locations. I've not visited the California Western Railroad. It's rather out of the way. It's on the old um, Northwestern Pacific routes at Willits. Napa Valley Wine Train I have taken both with and without my wife. So I can, I can recommend it highly if you like wine, trains and good food. Niles Canyon, fabulous preserve railway in the Niles Canyon to the east of the Bay Area. The Sacramento River train I've not taken. Um, it, it's slightly to the west of Sacramento. The Sacramento Southern and the Sacramento State Railroad Museum are both in Sacramento itself. The Santa Cruz Big Trees and Pacific Railway offers both narrow gauge uh, steam rides into the trees above uh, Felton and also to the ocean at Santa Cruz which is here. The Western Pacific Railroad Museum, um, it has a balloon track on which they operate. Local, uh, you can drive a train and enjoy a passenger ride. It's out of Portola. And you've got the Southern California Railroad Museum in Orange County, just to the east of Los Angeles. And finally, the San Diego Model Railroad Museum, which if you can't get to, to Hatchapi, you can see it in model form here. It is really worth a visit. And of course, it's also in Balboa Park, along with the zoo and other museums in San Diego. So a quick look at some photos. These are all my photos, by the way, Napa Valley Wine Train. Um, I, I couldn't find any I took um, enjoying wine and fine dining on the train um, in, in the, the appropriate lounge car on the train some years before this, but um, this was one evening we caught the train and the caboose parked up to advertise at Oakville. The Niles Canyon Railroad operates steam. Um, quite intriguing. They also have a museum just farther back down the track, which visitors can, can uh, enter. Assortment of steam and diesel. Sacramento Southern is very much diesel operated. Um, alongside the State Railroad Museum, where you can see one of the last built uh, cab forwards, now preserved, albeit not in running order, which is a shame. But they recreate a lot of the feeling of Californian rail travel. And of course, very shortly, we shall have the NMRA Model Railroad exhibit opening up in the State Railroad uh, Museum. At Felton, we have the Roaring Camp and Big Trees Railroad, which is the narrow gauge uh, element, which circles its way up into the trees. Uh, but I would caution that if you need to go to the toilet, go before you go, because all you've got up at the top is where the bears go. Portola, the Western Pacific Railroad Museum, although it says Western Pacific, it actually contains a lot of SP equipment as well. It's very, very dynamic. It actually has a balloon track. It has tourist trains operating around that, and you can drive a train for yourself. With a lot of UP uh, exhibits as well, DD40AX, SP in Kodachrome, 
Now, of course, back to Santa Clara, San Francisco would not be complete without traveling on a cable car or six. And I have never sat on a seat yet on a San Francisco cable car. You've got to hang on the side. And that is Alcatraz in the distance um, behind the, the picture on the right. If you're thinking of doing it, book it in advance. If you want to go to Alcatraz, it sells out so quickly. Do not leave it until you get to San Francisco. And the streetcars are another experience as well. They have streetcars from all over the world. They actually have um, a Blackpool streetcar tram um, in their collection. I think this one here in front of you is from uh, Melbourne, Australia. And finally, the San Diego Railroad Museum. Um, this is a view from Caliente up the hill going towards Allard. Uh, you saw a photograph of the UP train waiting for a BNSF intermodal to come down. Well, that's the same stretch of track. It's a fabulous feat of model making. So, St. Louis, what, what do you have in mind? Well, there's a few things. Um, time in Chicago, take the Texas Eagle or Amtrak Lincoln down to St. Louis. It's a hot spot. Um, there's Budweiser. Well, is it really beer? Yeah, well, that's another story. And take a road trip afterwards. Um, just an idea. This is what we did beforehand. This is Dalton Junction from the air. And, yeah, it's busy. Uh, Derek Murphy was with me. And he knows just how busy it was. Santa Fe Junction, Kansas City. Yeah, not all of that is railroads. There are a few roads, but not very many. The red line down the middle is the split between Missouri and Kansas. It goes right through where you want to stand to watch the trains. State Line Road is the top half of that page. It's got these railroads, sorry, too quick. But Ray Weston, here's the view on that very overhead railroad there is where the derailment occurred about three weeks ago. The UP train came off the tracks, it split the turnouts and made a real mess, but it was salvaged. Look on Virtual Rail Fan to see um, how they recovered it. It's busy. You may want to watch some urban. This is at Union Station. It's a walkway across to uh, um, a great area where they've got barbecue restaurants on the left hand side. Um, yeah, well worth doing it. If you can't get decent barbecue in Kansas City, it's not getting it's not worth getting barbecue anywhere. And our road trip took us back into Chicago. And Rochelle, many people have heard of this, is actually in the, the tracks in the middle. It's got a formal location. It's got a shop, a museum. Um, there are drinks you can get. It was closed the day we were there, ironically. But you can get that close to the trains. Uh, Derek, I'll, I'm sure you'll excuse me for that photograph. UP and BNSF. Um, as the road trips, there are so many suggestions you can take. To get to Santa Clara, I would suggest you think about going to Seattle and driving down the West Coast or going from Santa Clara to L.A. and back down the coast and back up the Central Valley or do a Seattle circular tour or a Denver circular tour. Or if you know that there's steam out there on the Union Pacific, chase some steam. Seattle, you've got lots of choice about locations, hot spots. Um, Stevens Pass, great to chase trains. Sand Point, very attractive, very picturesque location. Columbia River, Vancouver, Washington, fabulous hotspot. You've got the short lines as epitomized by the uh, Portland and Western lo the train on the right hand side and the Cascades. Stevens Pass, train here coming out from the Cascades Tunnel under Cowboy Mountain. And here's Cowboy Mountain and the tunnel itself. We actually sat there and watched the headlights appear 7.8 miles away at the end of the tunnel. Um, absolutely incredible experience. There's Cowboy Mountain, very volcanic. 
And we are back in Wenatchee on the east side and the classic Cascadian fruit warehouse. Mountains, forests, and here we are at Standpoint, Idaho. Yes, that is the same train in the distance still crossing um, the, the Lake, Lake Pendore. The Columbia River. Uh, Washington on the left, on the north side, BNSF, on the south side, Oregon, which is UP. And here's Vancouver. The Amtrak station is where it says Vancouver in the middle. Um, you can stand there and watch the trains all day long. Post Starlight, Post Starlight, sorry, Cascadians, the BNSF, UP, and Portland and Western. Cascadian? It gets busy. Coast Starlight and lots of switching, old, you know, old units uh, on local switching. And to the left, you can see one of the switches they use in the port itself at Vancouver. You may want to go to Colorado. Now, I started my rail planning holidays in Colorado. You've got the Moffat route, you've got the joint line. Um, classic locations, not as busy as some locations, but nonetheless, very, very picturesque. You've got lots of museums, and of course, you've got the narrow gauge. The Moffat Tunnel is an experience. It's a long dirt road to get there. Make sure it's good weather when you do it. The joint line, it's joint line because it's the DRGW and the Santa Fe. They were told to amalgamate the lines to make it two way during the war. That's what they did, and it's remained so ever since. This is at Palmer Lake. You can find sometimes the South Denver Loco. We were fortunate in 2003 to find three Rio Grande units on that service. I'm sure it's not the same today. It'll be UP units. They've been repainted. If you want to venture farther north into Nebraska, Crawford Hill, cold country, and farther north again, Wyoming and the Powder River. Triple track, and it's throbbing with coal trains, if that's your thing. If you want to chase trains, we'll come back to that in a minute. Tourist railroads in Colorado, it's unbelievable. You can see all this there. Here's a map of Colorado, where it is in the States. We've got the Durango and Silverton, Cumbers and Toltec, Leadville Railway. Uh, we've got the uh, Georgetown Loop. We've got the State Railroad Museum at Golden. We've got the uh, Royal Gorge in the area to the west of Pueblo. And finally, we've got the Modern Railroad Museum at Greeley. A few pictures to illustrate those places. Again, these are all my photographs. And I don't think that's a ski slope in the background, but it looks particularly like it. Relics of the old days abound. And here's a, a route plan of the Cumbers and Toltec Scenic Railroad, which I think is still jointly owned by the states of New Mexico to the south and Colorado to the north. And the line zigzags its way across the state line. You cannot take a day return from Antonito to Charma or vice versa by train. It takes too long. You either take a train from one end to the other and a coach back, or you take a train halfway and you swap trains. And again, similar traction. I cannot recommend it enough if you're in Colorado. Now, this photograph, I, I apologize for the quality of it, but the whiteness in the photograph is not steam or cloud, it is snow. We're at 10,000 feet, it was September, and it was trying to snow. It was bloody cold. The Colorado State Railroad Museum at Golden, Colorado is also worth a visit, making Colorado a state worth to go to. Again, they have a balloon track and they run trains around, narrow gauge and standard gauge. 
And that apparently one of the oldest locomotives in the world operating today. Finally, at Greeley, they have the Colorado Model Railroad Museum. It's privately owned, but nonetheless, I found it a day's trip worth making. I went there in 2018. It was the end and turning point of our road trip after the Kansas City Convention. So check it out, guys, please. Steam on the main line. Main, main line. Um, I, I thank Tom Watson for the photographs that come hereafter. They used to operate an annual tour between Denver and Cheyenne for the frontier days, but they stopped when sponsorship stopped. But in 2019, they had the great race to Promontory to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the striking of the Golden Spike. And they did a repeat, but took it farther west in October 2019. So these are photos by Tom from the event in May 2019. The big boy made its appearance. I could not believe having seen it in parts in Cheyenne in 2018 when we were there and we were given half an hour to have a look so we didn't distract the workers, all nine of them from their project of getting this ready for this event. This is uh, at uh, Lam Sutter in Wyoming, Tom tells me. This is approaching points of rocks in Wyoming. And here is a rest in Rock Springs, not to be confused with the layout by the uh, RS Tower guys from Exeter. And Tom Watson managed to get a seat in the, um, the cockpit, shall we say, of this. You can see him grinning there at us, but he's a, a friend of the Union Pacific Railroad, so he has a special place in their hierarchy. And here's not an untypical view of rail fans taking photographs of this monumental tour. Echo Canyon, Utah. And here we are, the, um, the end of it all, the recreation of the uh, Golden Spike Ceremony. Recreated every so often at the State Park uh, at um, the, the uh, Promontory Summit. So we have planning railroad hotspots. Here are some eastern ones, just to complete the, uh, the picture. Because I haven't been to any of these places, I have to say. I can't vouch for them, but there is a website that does. Right across the eastern USA. Pennsylvania, probably quite a hotspot, given the Horseshoe Curve and Steamtown. Um, so tourist lines, Georgia has quite a few. Maine has a lot more. Of course, it has the main two-footers at the Sandy River and Rangeley Lakes Railroad. Michigan, surprisingly enough, has a lot as well. And Pennsylvania, as I say, um, Strasburg Railroad, as I say, I, I, I single out because it's the it claims to be the longest operating railroad in the world in the Western Hemisphere. The best of the rest. Well, I, I've not been to any of these. Cass stands out. It was on that list from the USA Today. Um, Conway, friends have recommended and the Canyon, Grand Canyon Railroad. I actually have traveled on. Yes, it's an experience. And I think it's probably the easiest way to travel from Williams out to the south rim of the Grand Canyon, which is 56 miles away. That's a reasonable journey. Now, just a few tips. Don't trespass. You will get arrested. You will get your names taken. You will forever be on somebody's list. There are no fences unlike the UK at line side, except that perhaps at passenger depots. They're very security conscious. They have asked in the past people to stop taking photographs. For whatever reason, I do not know, but 9-11 is a factor. Please let people know where you're going, particularly if you're out in the desert. Take plenty of water if you do. 
it can get very hot in places like California. Even Colorado can be very hot in summer. Um, make sure your car, your hire car, has plenty of gas in it, you know, petrol. They do guzzle it. You're talking gallons to the mile, not miles to the gallon. Get a good car. I always try and get an SUV. It's got a better height, ride height. Um, if you want to take it off road, but there's a caution. High altitudes, small cars don't operate very well without the oxygen. And get a good map. Say the lawn is my preference. And beware, if you go off road, you may find you're not insured. So if it says don't do this, don't do that. It says, you know, stand back. This is guidance on UP's website. Keep a distance from the tracks. Be on the safe side. Do not trespass. And always expect a train. And on the roads, stop means stop. As Derek will tell you, I failed to stop dead at a stop sign. I couldn't see what was coming left or right. So I rolled forward. But a highway patrol sheriff thought that I was breaking the law and called us over. So I can speak from experience. Stop means stop. Just a few things on language. Shunting is switching. Bogies and trucks, wagons and cars, points and trips and ships. And as I say, beware being asked from where in Australia you come from. And if you can't get there, you can always watch it from home on SPV. They've got a huge source of DVDs. But if you've got any questions, now is the time, but you've only got minus one minute to do it. They can. Uh, hopefully they can now. My mic's on. So um, thanks, Mike. We have a few a few questions um, on the live stream. It's mostly people recommending other places to go and watch, uh, such as Elkhart Yard and in Indiana. Just uh, I think that's just east of Chicago, yeah, southeast of Chicago. Um, I'm just going to go back and check questions on the chat. Jonathan asks the Coombers and Toltec and the DNS were once joined up on the same system, weren't they? No one's answered him, so I don't know if you know the answer to that. Uh, I think they were part, I mean, Pagosa Springs comes to mind. I think they were part of the DRGW uh, narrow gauge circle. Of course, you've got the RGS that went to the west of Durango as well, which is no, there's no longer any anything there apart from I think at Ridgeway there might be a, a, some artifacts that have been preserved cool uh, I think that was it that was that was great uh, Mike thank you very much for that presentation um, we've got just under 50 viewers in total uh, watching really? at the moment okay. yeah, yeah. So pretty good and I can see I can see some folk have answered the questions as well which is good yeah thank yeah. you guys yeah uh, so in the interest of time we will uh, go straight to our next presenter. We're not going to cut the cut the stream for anyone into like our usual rolling schedule because uh, we're being quite efficient tonight. So, David Amon, if you are there, can you unmute yourself? And uh, Mike, thank you very much. Let you You're go welcome. on mute and uh, get you off off camera. Hopefully. Right, I'm unmuted. Excellent. There we go. Oh, we can see you now. Okay, that's great. So if you want to share your slides or whatever and start your presentation, mm -hmm. that would be great. Everyone else, just stay on mute. And if you've got any questions, folks watching from home, uh, either in the WebEx chat or on the live stream chat, and I'll put them to David at the end of the clinic. So, David, are you able to share? Um, I thought I was. No, not yet. All right, let's go back then. Let's do it now.
There we go, it's just coming through, it's just taking its time. Right. I can't see anything yet, I'm just seeing them. There we go, I see your presentation. Great, so you just want to make that go full screen and we'll be good. Right, um, yes, the N-scale layout, a 6x5.3 board. When um, you're looking at model railways, there are three things, time, money, and space. Uh, very rarely do these three come together at one time. And this is the story of, of how I made them come together. I'd attended a lot of um, NMRA events in the UK over the years with a friend, Alan Sewell, um, but I'd never really uh, got into modern railroading in, in those days. I really started when I was much younger with uh, some British layouts, but because of lack of one of or all of those three I mentioned earlier, I uh, never got anything going. Then about 10 years ago, um, space did become available and there was a bit of time as I'd retired and a little bit of money to spend on it. We also, there was a spare room. Um, the room wasn't very large, so I decided to model in N scale. And I thought the shelf layout would suit the room. The aforementioned Alan Seal found a, 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 a layout plan in Model Railroader, uh, which he thought could be adapted to a shelf layout. Having looked at the plan, I decided there had a number of features in it which I liked, and I decided to, uh, pre uh, to, to create it as originally conceived. The planned, I say planned powers DC, I didn't even know DCC existed when I started this project. The plan that Alan had suggested came from um, a supplement to Model Railroader, five compact track plans. And if I can uh, thank Comeback Media for the permission to use the images from Model Railroader in this presentation. This is the actual article or the start of it um, by Keith Thompson. The model railway, uh, the railway is based on an actual place. Kutani Lake is in the Canadian province of British Columbia. The southern end of the lake is about 50 miles from the USA border. The railhead is situated northwest of Gerard, um, just around here near near Trout Lake. And finishes at Lardau, if that's pronounced properly, on the northern end of Kootenay Lake. One of the features of Canadian railways in this area, well, in the past anyway, was the use of, of car floats or barges. And this was one of the things which attracted me to building this railroad. It's a five car track barge that you can see in there. You can see here the apron lifting, which is which will actually be part of the model. And you can see the barge. You can see this actually has a, a switcher um, or road switcher on on the ferry, which isn't always the case. I think in the eastern states, New York, I don't think the locos are allowed on the barges. Um, but as you can see, with the weight of a loco, uh, you, that can give some operating fun in trying to balance the load. This is the track plan, um, and you can see uh, the the, load, the logs are loaded in the forest. You can see the roads leading into the forest from there, which is modelled. Um, it goes around the bottom end of Trout Lake, and the log trains will dispose of their load in the log pond, which is also modelled. The, um, the finished product is, is put into these buildings and loaded on to the track here, and those tracks are then loaded onto the barge. The track is Atlas, and again, as a beginner's layout, it was very easy to construct because it uses Atlas Code 80. Um, Atlas Flex Track was not available at the time in the UK, so I use Pico Pico Flex Track instead. Um, this I was able to join quite um, easily with using the Pico joiners for Code 80. 
Right, the, it was assumed that um, it would be built from solid pieces of eight by four insulation board um, cut into a six by three form. This was then to be formed into a sandwich with a one inch layer on top of this two inch layer. The off cuts could then be used to create the central ridge and other raised features. And also the, the, um, and the one inch layer would have cutouts in it for, to form the two main lakes and in this area here um, to form the log pond. Um, to cut the material, I decided to use hot, hot wire tools. Um, they were bought from a company called Foam Factory. And at the time, this kit cost £80. It consisted of three tools, which I'll show you about in a moment, and, and a power supply. Um, it's now very difficult to get hold of in the UK um, and, well, and expensive if you can find it. I think partly because they use a, a variable power uh, power supply now. Right, this is the tool I used mainly for cutting. It's called Hot Knife, and it was used for cutting the boards to size. Um, it's also good for rough shaping and uh, for drilling holes in the board. Um, you can cut, it will do a saw type in through two inch high density board with very little difficulty. This um, is it in operation. This may not be coming up very well on the stream, but that's the hot knife in action. The board, um, I couldn't get eight before, so as I said, I had to buy four by twos. Um, and uh, therefore, how was I going to create the six by three format on for the two inch? And I decided to do that by making a frame. The frame is wide enough here to, to form a trout lake and wide enough here to form the um, the Casanui Lake. I used, um, I formed dovetails in the ends of the board of the cut pieces to um, aid the uh, adhesion to the, to the pieces. Here you can see um, the knife being used to cut the shape of, the rough shape of Kootenai Lake um, shoreline. And then we go on to the use of the sculpting tool. And this is useful for shallow angle cuts, shallow hollowing, and shallow hollowing. And here we'll see a little brief, the, the um, tool in operation. You can see this is all done on the dining room table when the wife was out. I won't dwell on that because I suspect the stream is not showing this very well. All right. All right. And there you can see the cuts made. And that's just a bit repetitive, so we'll go on to the next slide. Right, there is um, a router tool, which isn't part of the set that I bought. Um, it's, it uses a much thicker wire, therefore I need a, a higher, uh, so you can hold a shape, uh, but it needs the pro power supply. Um, it's useful for concave shapes. Um, for example, you could make a rectangle shape um, and, and cut that into the a hollow into your uh, into your board, which is quite difficult to do with knives and things. You have, either have to cut right through and then refill. So it's quite useful for that. So detailed hollow shapes, it would have been very useful if I'd had that when I was trying to create the, the log pond. And then finally the engraving tool this is useful for uh, this detailed sculpting. It's not really that appropriate for model railroaders. Um, if you were doing a figure, for example, um, a proper sculpture, but you could use it for lettering into the um, into the board. 
And the main use, I think, for, um, for our purposes would be for creating wire channels in, in the board. Here you can see the offcuts being um, put together to create the central ridge. And there you can see the work of the sculpting tool where it's been used to get these shallow cuts, which are quite difficult to do with the knife. And then you, and you can see here the, the pond being has been hollowed out as well, the log pond. Um, this was put in place just to test that I'd got enough clearance in the cutting. And then after having checked the clearances, I used um, moulds for doing the rock faces. Um, excuse me, I've just got it behind all my... Yeah, the, the rubber moulds were filled with Woodland's casting plaster and they were used to create the paste. I painted them using a mixture of acrylics and washes and there you can see the final result using some very cheap trees on the top there which, I'm, which I hope to replace. They came from Hong Kong and I think it was about five for 50 pounds for 50 trees with free postage. And there you can see the um, the magic water is by unreal details and that was used for all the water features it is expensive but a little goes a long way especially if you have a leak woodson's casting past was used for all the cast features and surface coatings where required on the foam here i the easiest way with it especially with set track is to to draw onto the uh, the layout where the track's going to go and test the positioning of the turnouts. Um, everything was held in together with um, notice board pins. Right, one of the um, problems I came across using um, Atlas turnouts is that unlike the Pico which I'd used, Atlas points, uh, uh, turnouts don't have springs in them. Um, so I had to find a way of holding the moving rail against the stop rail. And I used hand throws from Caboose to do that, which are sprung and, and work very well. The only thing I don't like about them is they're vastly oversized in end scale. Right, uncoupling um, was going to be achieved by strategically placed permanent magnets under the track. Now this, you see the area here this is where that routing tool would have been very useful because the height of the magnet is a little higher than the um, cork. So just a shaped depression uh, would have been used. And I had to do a lot of digging with, with um, scalpels and things to try and get that into place. Been a lot easier with, with the sculpt, with the um, routing knife, routing tool. Right. the. Uh, test run. I test ran it and it was successful um, with DC. But when I put multiple locos on the tracks, I found they all started moving uh, together. And that's because I made the schoolboy error of not insulating the sidings um, and expecting the turnouts to do it for me, which um, with Atlas, they're DCC friendly. And therefore, the whole thing was live. And as I said, they all started moving. However, that made it perfect for DCC. So that got me involved in a little additional expense, which I wasn't expecting. So I bought um, a second-hand lens system, mainly because the Thamesiders group, which I, by this time I had I joined, um, that was their, the system they were using. And the Multimass Throttle um, is, uh, is compatible with the lens system. But I like it because it had the central, uh, central control thing, you know, a center off, which I was used to from my childhood days. I now use a DigiKey system as it's built in Wi-Fi. And I think the layout, because it has only one entry and this is uh, plugged straight into the command uh, unit, uh, uh, Wi-Fi means I can operate the layout from um, from a smartphone. And the, the there are possibilities of having more than one operator. So having that was useful. Right, moving on to buildings and structures, um, the, the plan, uh, the 
the article gave a, a list of, of buildings that they suggested to use on the layout, um, but the first building um, was not available. Um, it, was, it was supposed to be a gantry crane from Model Power, uh, so I used this Faller, the Faller kit instead, um, but I, I kit bashed it a little bit to put a, it had a hook on the original, this was put on as a, a way of, of, with chains to load the logs onto the onto the truck, onto the cars, and it didn't look very substantial. It didn't look like it could hold a log, so I put extra timbers around it to try and give an impression that it was a, a more substantially built item. The the top I changed so that the, this whole the, the motor is assumed to be in here, and the whole unit moves up and down. Whereas this in the original, this was a, a shelter that went along the whole length. Um, one of the pieces which was to be scratch built for, in the article was the apron, uh, which you can see here. Um, the again, this uh, was made easier because uh, the, it was full scale for for end gauge in the article. The barge um, is constructed out of a solid piece of four by one um, inch pine. And there you can, and here you can see um, the magic water put into Kootenay Lake. The um, this is the the sawmill, and that's a water's kit. Um, it came with the powerhouse um, and a waste burner, and a, a side loading conveyor into the. Uh, into the shed. These are probably familiar. Um, for working from the left, you've got Eric's Emporium, um, Merchant's Row, which is on practically everybody's layout. And the final kit was meant to be a, um, a, a country store, which again wasn't available at the time. So I put this uh, another DPM kit in there. The next building. Um, to give it a bit more interest to the layout, giving you an, another uh, operation, if you like, there was a grain, a grain elevator, and this is a, a wooden laser cut kit by American Model Builders, and this was my first attempt at uh, at constructing a wooden laser kit. Now, operations. Here you can see the aerial view of the layout. Um, if we can start seeing operations down here um, with a log train. Uh, being having been loaded, it then follows the tracks around to the uh, log log dam into the log pond, and then then normally that would just reverse back into to the trees. Um, the the cars here, the box cars are being loaded, and they will eventually end up on the on the barge. And as I said before. You've got a boxcar here loaded with grain waiting also to be loaded onto the barge. So to see that in operation here we can see a shay that's going to pull the logs away from the railhead and there it continues its route along the by Trout Lake and arrives at the the mill. Um, now, obviously, there are some things which you have to um, imagine in model railroading. Obviously, there was no room to make the log pond the size of a real log pond. So this is to give you an impression, if you like, of a log pond. The logs were laid into the pond before the magic water set. It, there's a slight oozing up the side, so it's not so that it makes it, the water look a little bit more treacly than it should. Um, but as I say, this was a first attempt. I'm not, there may be ways um, of, of improving on that. And now here's the the uh, the, the barge. Um, this is still a work in progress. I found it quite hard to get hold of bollards with the right size in end scale. And then when I did get them, I didn't buy enough. Um, the barge is another one where um, it's been compressed. Um, these barges, as I said, in the 
the, the, the prototype, this would take about five cars. This one takes um, a four cars, four car, uh, two cars, four cars in total. Um, again, the um, the Alco S2 is collecting the finished product from from the sawmill, ready for transfer to the car float. Again, I was unable to get hold of the Water Street freight terminal, which was suggested in the article. But a former member of Thames Siders, Bob Skinner, scratch built this where this warehouse here, um, and it's and it's probably more appropriate than the um, the building suggested in the article anyway. Here you can see the switcher moving the the loaded box car from the elevator down to the docks, and just to give the the um, switching engineer a little bit more to think about. Um, it passes um, a passing bud rail car is going to get in the way. Right, improvements I would make. Well, I think the looking at the strat, the trout lake, um, you could make an inlet into that and therefore justify a bridge or bridges. Um, in a small girder bridge perhaps would, would improve, I guess I give an added um, to the, could add to the scheme to this thing. Um, it because it's portable and it's kept against a wall or under a bed or wherever, um, it does get a little battered over time. So I would need to do, redo some of the ground cover to improve the appearance, um, and also um, ballast tends to come off quite easily when it's um, when it's not laying flat. Um, I said I'd like to improve on the trees uh, along the ridge. The ridge is meant to be a, a scene divider. It's meant you, it's meant to be looked at as two halves, long ways, rather than looking at it as a as an oval. Need to finish off the car float. Um, some of the buildings uh, were my first attempts at painting, and when I look on it again now, yes, they do need repainting, and some buildings could do it re-weathering. Um, it's a thin piece of plywood or perspex fascia to protect it from knocks, and in some places where it gets really near the edges, to protect the stock from falling on the floor would be good. One of the problems of, of, of this lightweight construction, and and it's intended to be used on on a on a table, is that it moves very very easily. Um, I think uh, some sort of mat underneath it would be would help, but but you have to really make sure it doesn't fall on the floor. Right. In summary, if you think you didn't have a room for a layout, then a six by four three, which is quite common in the states, they call them door back door layouts. I think. Um, it's certainly worth considering. It's easily stored against a bed or against a wall. Um, it can be set up in a dining room table, uh, in the dining room table or on a folding table. It can be started and finished in your lifetime, even if you're in your 70s. Insulation board, I think, is a good material for building lightweight baseboards and built in layers is it, good for eliminating that flat look. You don't need to choose oval or end to end. You can incorporate both features in one layout. And small can still be interesting, a layout for operations. And a, a car float is an interesting way of bringing in and removing rolling stock from the layout. Um, and I would also say in these times when we, we can't get out and about, if you're a member who's usually had um, a club layout to go to, then with, as this is likely to, as the, that's not locked down as such, but these restrictions on movement, shall we say, it's likely to go on for some months, and this could be the time to consider building your own railroad for, at, at home. Right, and of course you have to have a, a number two engineer. This is my granddaughter, who is about to run the little uh, uh, 70 tonner around the track at around about 200 miles an hour. Uh, because she knows how to wind up granddad. And that, I think, is it. Shall I stop sharing?
Hi, David. It's um, Chris James here. I'm fascinated because uh, I've got a little box full of N-gauge stock, which I've had for a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I keep thinking it's about time I built the layout. And I'm toying with the idea of either building it on a, a door. I've got a couple of, um, you know, these these plywood door things. Mm -hmm. um, but it would probably be too heavy. So uh, perhaps the foam, um, the, the cellar for the uh, cellar text board would be a, a yeah, better yeah. idea. I just wonder, did you tell me what the minimum radius is that you're using? Ah, now that is quite interesting. It's um, it's eleven inches, I think. It's a it's a nineteen inch nineteen inch um, easement, and it goes into I think an eleven inches at, at its sharpest. Um, and if the thing moves around that, okay, does it? Yeah, t uh, today I was trying out um, a full length passenger car on it and it, it got around the 11. I had to make some adjustments in the cut in the cutting because uh, that was the main problem. It, it got too close to the cutting. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, yeah, most things uh, you find a lot of proprietary stuff in Engage is meant to is made to go around very sharp curves, um, I think down to nine inches. Uh, we've got one question that came in. Um, we've got one question that came in on this on the stream, um, and that question was: uh, uh, Are you finding that using the foam uh, creates any excessive transmission of track sounds? Um, I've I've heard this said in the past, but I haven't noticed it. Um, I have laid cork on top of the foam. Um, but particularly these days when we start using, you know, when we use sound locos anyway, I, I, I think the the added sound is, is not really a problem. Cool. That was all the questions that I can see. So thank you very much, David. I'm just going to yeah. cut us over to um, our slide deck on the live stream while we get the next clinic uh, set up and running. Um, but we'll be uh, we'll be right back shortly. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is the British Region Convention 2020 and uh, we're with our next clinic, uh, which is an introduction to T-Gage with Michael Towers. And uh, I will just hand it right over to Michael and uh, let you all sit back and enjoy the clinic in just a second. Just a reminder, questions in the chat, please. Comments on YouTube and Facebook. 
and uh, in the chat for the British Region members in WebEx. And if the rest of you that are not Michael could stay on mute, that would be fantastic. Okay, Michael, all yours. Cool. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Michael Towers. Uh, I, I go to the Watt Group in London. Um, I've seen that Ray is on the, the conference. So, hi, Ray. Um, I'm going to give uh, an introduction to T-Gage. Uh, I did write an article in the Roundhouse magazine a few months ago, so some of you may have seen some of the bits that I might have in here. Um, so, Starting off, what is T-Gage? Uh, some of you might have heard of it, some of you might not have done. Uh, I know at exhibitions, there's still always lots of people that haven't seen it. Um, so T-Gage is 1 to 450 or 1 to 480 scale uh, with 3 millimeter gauge between the rails. Uh, that's what the T stands for. And um, it is called T-Gage regardless of it actually being T-scale, uh, that's just because it's the, the trade name. So I apologize if I keep calling it T-gauge. Um, <coughs> it is the smallest commercial model railway scale available at the moment. Um, actually holds a Guinness World Record for it. Um, and the criteria for that is to have uh, rolling stock that actually has a motor that powers the, the train on board the train. So it's powered on by two rails, just like uh, the larger scales, basically. But the the difference is that it uses magnetic wheels and uh, steel uh, rails so that it can uh, uh, gain adhesion and uh, for conductivity. So some general information. Um, it's primary, uh, primarily sold through uh, one place at tgauge.com and you can get a load of 3D printed stuff uh, on shapeways.com. Uh, uh, there are other places that, that sell bits and bobs, but the tgauge.com is the place to get most of the stuff uh, outside of Japan. Um, there's also some individuals who make bits and bobs, um, like you can get some uh, custom locos and things uh, on the Facebook trade group, that sort of thing. Uh, there is a Facebook group and a, a web forum called Talking T Gauge uh, for, for it. And considering it, it's small size, you can actually get most things uh, that you would in larger scales, uh, despite it being really, really small. Uh, I've just seen someone's popped up the minimum radius for T-gauge as a question. Um, I was going to answer that um, later on with a demonstration of, of uh, something I've got in here with me. Um, the, the minimum radius you can get and run stuff on is uh, 60 millimeters, um, which is pretty tight but it get, can get a little bit unreliable when you get that tight um, you need short chassis and things um so um where was i uh, with the um most things being available uh, in the the picture there um the fences uh you can get fences now uh, with etch brush sheets oh okay um that's really weird. Uh, da, 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 da. Share content. And it should be working. Just try if I. Oops. Now what's happened? Disappeared. I've lost it from my screen. <laughs> uh, is that working? You see a different screen now? So has he got a, a, an actual picture of a train this time? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, a two Australian dollars coin. So, uh, yeah, I've gone through that slide. <laughs> so, is this slide working? Should be another slide now. Cool. <laughs> cool. So, um, yeah, so uh, I was just uh, about to explain what was in the picture there that no one could see. Um, so... Um, and here you've got um you can get animals so uh, unfortunately my camera doesn't do justice to the sheep in that picture but they've all got individual legs and such um and the the fence there is from a etched brass sheet uh, and individually all of the fence posts are individually glued down um the track pictured there is a set track that has been painted and the loco oh the dmu is um two 3d printed bodies uh on a generic chassis um painted by myself so a, 
quick history of T-Gage. It's probably the, the newest commercial scale at the moment. Um, it started development in 2005 when uh, a Japanese guy, Hirotsugo Hirai, decided that he wanted uh, a model railway scale that could fit in the same area as, as his laptop. And he spent three years developing it. Um, so in 2008, it was uh, unleashed on the public um, with the um, the little blue uh, DMU type thing in the, the picture there. That was the Japanese Class 103, which came out as a, a five coach set with uh, two drive units. And uh, it even had directional lighting um, in it. Uh, for some for some reason, this scale has seemed to become quite popular in the UK compared to other countries. Uh, that's uh, uh, proportionally um, popular because obviously it's a very niche scale as it is anyway, but um, there seems to be a fair amount of support in the UK and uh, the, the main place to get it is, is the shop in Edinburgh, tgauge.com. Um, so they, they brought out the UK Class 43 um high speed train or intercity a few years ago um and you can get the full uh nine uh diesel and coach set uh which comes to about a length of about 40 centimeters altogether so the, the full train for that is not very long uh in real terms and um because it's been around for a few years um and that uh, with the invention of 3D printing and how fine that has got, it has been a real boost to uh, this scale. So you can now get uh, quite a variety of UK, US and European rolling stock uh, and buildings and such uh, available. And um, shapeways.com has a load of that where you just choose what you want and they'll 3D print it and send it to you in the post. And it is really quite cheap as well. So the, the two car DMU cost me, I think it was about, eight quid for the two bodies um so it, it's not not expensive um compared to some other scales and uh, this is a, a size comparison um this was a, a castle class loco that i was working on compared to a double o gauge castle class loco um i didn't finish this loco unfortunately because i i messed up the um main drive wheels uh and couldn't put the rods on it so um yeah, I kind of gave up after a while on that. Uh, and this is um, a Class 67, so I was at an exhibition and uh, I saw a, um, a layout with exactly the same de uh, loco that I was running on my T-gauge layout at the exhibition. Um, so I asked him very nicely and he let me uh, put my T-gauge version on top. So um, <laughs> one of the things that um, I think people think sometimes at exhibitions is that uh, T-gauge can be a bit of a novelty scale or a, a bit of a fad. Um, so th there have been examples like um, this with a, a layout on a hat and you get plenty of layouts where people have uh, got a box file or a, a um, flight case and put a, a simple loop in it. Uh, and even my own layout's a bit guilty of this because I built it in a guitar case and it, it's kind of a, a novelty shape. But it, it really is more than just a novelty scale now with the support and um, the different uh, things you can get available for it. Uh, and you can model proper uh, scale uh, railways. Um, and 3D, rail, uh, 3D printing has really made that possible. And you can fit a lot more into this scale that you can't do uh, in larger scales. And you can uh, model an area effectively without using selective compression. So um, I, I did for a while plan to do a, um, a model of either Bedford or Milton Keynes Station because I, I grew up in that area. And uh, my plan was to have a seven foot long layout and in seven feet, you can fit roughly a mile of uh, real world. So you've got quite a, a scope for fitting in a large area in a very small space. And uh, I'm hoping these videos uh, stream all right, but um, to, to make it, well, to, to prove the point of it's more than just a um, novelty, this is uh, a short clip of uh, what I think is probably the most detailed um, 
T gauge layout um, there is available. This is uh, a layout called Orbost in um, Australia. And uh, this was built by uh, two Australian guys, obviously. Um, and they've scratch built so much stuff on it, buildings, scenery, fences. Um, and it, it's a great example of what you can fit in that scale uh, and running at scale speed as well. Most people would probably think the T-Gage is running at um, 300 miles an hour and it can do if not done correctly. Um, so uh, this is Orbost station and you can really see that you can fit a lot in in a small space without it looking too crowded. And then uh, later on in the clip, uh, um, there's a 157 pier, 770 meter long trestle bridge that they scratch built all of the trestles for. It does look a little bit wobbly when you zoom in that close, but uh, it is incredibly small. So, uh, oh, is that flashing? Yeah. Cool. Is that better? It's not. Oh. Okay. Um. So yeah, that's. This is a, a really, really detailed layout. All the trees are scratch built. The fence posts you can see, but because of the quality of the camera, you can't see that they've actually put uh, really thin wire strands between all the fence posts to represent the, um, the fence itself. And it's just a really amazing layout. So uh, I, I won't sit through the entire four and a half minute video on here but uh, if anyone is interested then um, just search for Orbost O-R-B-O-S-T and it, it, it really is an amazing layout. Um, so uh, <coughs> I thought I'd give some examples of uh, the sorts of things that you may not think are possible in T-Gage that people have actually done and there are things in here that most people wouldn't attempt in larger scales. Um, so DCC um, is available in T-Gage, so this decoder is only six millimeters by five millimeters. Uh, I've got an example here, but uh, I'm not quite sure how to switch between uh, PowerPoint and um, my own camera that quickly. Um, so it, it runs on uh, five volts on the loco, so this uh, will work with uh, a normal 15 volt DCC system and it will step it down to five volts for the loco. And uh, it does have directional lighting built in as well. So um, providing that the videos hold up, this is a, a demonstration from the tgauge.com people of um, two single uh, car diesel units, diesel passenger units um, operating independently on the same track with uh, working lighting. And some objects around it for scale as well. <laughs> Um, where are we? Um, whoops. There we go. This is a, a working level crossing, uh, which is on my own layout. Um, I think it may be the smallest working model le level crossing layout in the world, unless someone's made one in a smaller scale. But um, so th these gates have a clearance of less than a millimeter uh, at the fence posts. Apologies for the derailed train that ran through. <laughs> so th this actually was really easy to do in T-Gage. Um, it just uses the same mechanism as a, a double O scale um, set of moving gates. Um, but all the gubbins is hidden underneath and it just needs two poles that move 90 degrees, basically. Um, so that was 
um, I wouldn't say too uh, particularly easy to do, but um, the mechanisms and everything were already in existence. Pardon me. Uh, this is Martin Caselis's layout called Sarum Bridge, uh, where he's got a lovely um, viaduct on it, but he's uh, made this working car system in T-Gage, um, which not only has cars going around in a loop, there's actually a, a junction there where they can change direction. And this is um, powered by a, there's a couple of PCB boards under the road surface there that have um, an array of tiny electromagnets. So they, they just pull the cars along um, around these two tracks. And uh, here it is on the actual layout. So there's no actual working wheels on these, I believe. I, I think they're just um, sort of moving along the ground. There's a, another wider shot of his layout further on. So here you can see the, the massive viaduct he's got in the background. It's, um, again, really nice quality of buildings and such that he's got on his layout. Then um, there's a German guy who works in T age at 1 to 480 scale. Um, I'm probably mispronounce his name, but uh, I think it's Yu Fenk or Uwe Fenk or something. Um, he scratch builds steam locos in T gauge. So um, this two six uh, two four zero that he's got here um, works. It has a motor in it with working rods. Um, this is a, a four six two that he scratch built with two motors in it. Again, it works. Uh, there it is on the track and. Um, Again, here's a, a clip of uh, his stuff running. Um, so this is his model of the Flying Scotsman um, and is the only motorized unit in this train, whereas most people would uh, have motors in the coaches and such. This is a fully working steam loco in T gauge that he has scratch built. And it's utterly mind blowing that he's uh, made these. So he's also uh, made a working 040, 040 Bayer Garrett. Um, and this is his Mallard model. And he has a, he's made quite a few different scratch built locos in uh, T gauge. Then there's uh, one thing that has been in magazines and exhibitions all over the country, and uh, that is the the model of the fourth bridge. So the, the entire fourth bridge uh, in T gauge. Uh, it's a 25 foot long layout, um, and the bridge is 18 feet long, even at 100 uh, 1 to 450 scale. Uh, and the bridge is entirely 3D printed, um, and so are all the houses on the layout. Um, the guy, Doug Kitely, he used Google Maps to map out everything perfectly and he took photos of houses on site so he could design all those to be accurate and everything. And um, it is a, an immense, immense uh, model, basically. Uh, skip past the intro, it's quite long. And uh, this is it running with a an HST. So this is the full length HST that I was mentioning earlier. It actually has uh, three drive units, so uh, one at each end for the diesel units, and the um, buffet car has a, a motor in it as well. Um, because with T gauge, you kind of need as many motors as possible um, for reliability and to make it run at a decent scale speed. But it takes over a minute for the uh, train to to travel across the entire um, fourth bridge.
you can see on the, the ground there all the um, individual houses and buildings. Those are all accurate to the actual houses and buildings that are there in real life next to, to the uh, fourth bridge. So um, this guy is pretty hardcore making this layout. He did it all by himself. It wasn't a group of people. He designed all of this himself and printed it all off himself with his own 3D printer. <coughs> so, um, what, got, what got me into T-Gage in the first place? Um, so, uh, a few years ago, I was in the Royal Air Force, and uh, being in the Royal Air Force, I lived in barracks and... Uh, had hardly any space available to myself but um I, I wanted to model some form of railway and uh i, I went on to google uh, i searched for what is the smallest model railway gauge and t gauge is what came up and uh, i was very lucky that at the time i was having a look around uh, gauge master had uh, briefly decided to to put their foot into the water for t gauge and um quickly decided against it, presumably because they weren't selling much. Um, so they decided to sell off their uh, their demo stock. So um, managed to buy uh, what was quite a rare set off them is the, the shop demo kit with a load of track, um, five car, uh, Japanese class 103 and uh, controller. And uh, that, that got me started basically. Um, and I, I decided I wanted to have a layout that would be portable um, and sort of um, safe for transport because being in the Air Force I might have to move about. Um, and I decided on a guitar case so that I could have uh, an end-to-end -end track as well as uh, a loop in the middle of, of the guitar case. So um, it's worth mentioning that the, the controllers for T-Gage come with a built-in system for running trains end-to-end -end, uh, and they come with a couple of um, infrared sensors that you just plug into the track so that you can have an end-to-end -end track that literally automatically runs, uh, which is uh, brilliant. Um, and here's a, a short video I made five years ago that, that shows the stages of the, the layout and, and some of it running. So this is my own layout um, in a guitar case um i've done some modifications to it since this was uh, filmed so there's like a back scene there where there's currently black in the video um and i, I normally run a, a proper length hst not not a silly one with one coach in it <coughs> uh, apologies for the the quality of the camera that i had at the time um so this is the the guitar case i just went on to ebay bought a 30 pound guitar case ripped out everything inside and um made a big hole to make a hardboard base uh, and build a layout in it basically um <coughs> so uh, yeah it's just a, a hardboard base cut to shape for there uh, and stuck on a bunch of um wooden uh, blocks so that i could have some space underneath for uh, fitting wiring and transformer and it etc and the the layout itself actually just runs off of a simple uh, mobile phone usb charger um because everything runs off of five volts you can just get a usb adapter to power the controllers um so th this was uh first stage I, I built a layer up out of um card uh to put on top of the the double loop so that i could have the um end to end that you can see there now bit of a mistake because it made it really hard to uh, get to anything uh, this is um one of the the lovely etched brass bridges that you can buy uh, they come ready made um so i'm really glad for that but not ready painted so um it was a, an interesting challenge to airbrush something that small without getting all the tiny, tiny holes in the latticework uh, clogged up. And uh, there it is, unpainted on the station. So it was the early stages of fitting things in, and this is the pretty much finished project uh, product um, uh, when I sort of made it presentable. Um, work I did since then was making a working level crossing, uh, adding extra trees and bits and bobs. 
most of the uh, the buildings you see here are 3D printed. So all of the white buildings and the red brick buildings, they're all 3D printed off of Shapeways and then bought. And uh, you can see the horses and cows in the fields. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, my own personal T gauge layout. Um, took me about a year and a half to build it. Um, and uh, then I, I started taking it to some exhibitions uh, and people quite liked it at the exhibitions. Um, so I thought I'd show off the things that you can actually get in T-Gauge. So this is the standard um, drive unit chassis uh, with its uh, tiny, tiny little gearbox there um, and a tiny motor on the left-hand side. Uh, they use the... The tiny electric motors that you get in mobile phones to for the vibrate function obviously without the vibrating weight on the end um but without mobile phones you wouldn't have any t gauge because they wouldn't be small uh, small enough cheap enough motors um the bogies are held on by tiny tiny gold springs uh so those pull the bogey to the body and they also act as the uh, conductor from the wheels to the um to the motor you can get these chassis in various lengths. This one is the the 19 meter chassis, and you can get various blank bodies for uh, coaches. Uh, so, the ones on the left, uh, I think you can get in a couple of different sizes, uh, and they're quite good either for uh, sticking vinyl uh, stickers onto for for making coaches, or just to um, get a 3D printed body on. And the ones on the right are adjustable length ones. So uh, where it's got all the holes, uh, you can chop down the um, the chassis there and uh, make it shorter as necessary, or even just cut a gap in it to make it as short and long as you like. Um, you can get some American rolling stock now. So this is an e EMD GP8. Um, they don't come in any American liveries, unfortunately, but uh, there are some people out there who make decals in that size, uh, scale. Uh, you can get a track tamper, uh, which looks curiously like a network rail track tamper, um, which is actually a track cleaning loco. Uh, this is uh, one of the HST liveries, so you can get LNER, I think it's GWR, or um, you can get it in BR blue and grey. And you can get etched brass buildings. Um, so this is a signal box, and those are uh, actual signal box uh, levers on a lever frame uh, they don't come pre-assembled you have to glue those levers in yourself um, they are really really tiny I've got the kit and I have not taken it out of the packaging because it is too scary and also uh, this lovely etched brass um, engine shed uh, which again has some incredibly tiny parts uh, so I, I I don't know how they've actually managed to glue together this so nicely, to be honest. Um, you could, I mentioned the end-to-end uh, -end running um, with uh, some uh, diodes in the cables and stuff. You can uh, create uh, a loop like this or a variation of it where you've actually got a, a passing place and you can have two trains running opposite directions. Uh, and the points are a one-way point, so they don't actually have uh, point blades in. And with the magnetic wheels, it will hug the rail uh, and it will um, go straight on if it comes straight in. But um, with the way that this is set up, uh, well, it's got the arrows on there. So a train will come in, it will hit the sensor, then it will stop, and then there'll be a wait of a few seconds. And then the train on the other track uh, because it, the power is um, dioded, the train that train will then take off, do a loop, uh, and then stop, and then the other train will go off again. And then this, um, which unfortunately was going to be released in time for uh, in time for the NMRA conference, but because of uh, COVID and uh, a pr slight production setback, is now going to be out a couple of months later. So I was really hoping to demonstrate this uh, for the. For the talk um but yeah this is a british rail or british railways class 08 diesel um that does actually have a gearbox in there and it is powered uh, on all wheels and the this is a pre-production uh, example and the actual one will have working rods uh, on the wheels which i guess if i even sneeze at will probably break because they're so thin 
So uh, some of the things that you have to do differently uh, in tea compared to larger scales, uh, you need very steady hands and good eyesight because, um, well, it is very small. Um, gluing down small things can be incredibly fiddly with tweezers and um, if you need any sort of magnification and then ho holding it with tweezers, having a magnification and then trying to drop some glue on something can be a bit fiddly. I'm really lucky that my eyesight's quite good. Um, but for, for gluing down the fencing in the previous pictures of my layouts, each of the fence posts is individually glued down with a tiny blob of glue, a uh, super glue on the end of a pin. Um, and track cleaning, uh, if you think cleaning your HO or bigger layout every, uh, every month or so is a pain, um, T gauge trains tend to uh, need a lot of cleaning. So when I'm at an exhibition, uh, I will generally clean all the wheels on a, all the well, driving and pickup wheels on a, a train every two to three hours. Uh, and that, there's a picture of it on the right hand side. So I'll have to clean the, the wheel tread. And then in the center there, there's a dimple that holds the wheel, uh, holds the wheels to the um, bogies. And that also gets full of crud. Uh, and you have to clean all that out and then use a, uh, you can use a special conductive pen, which helps with the conductivity as well. Um, it's a bit of a Marmite thing. Some people like it, some people don't. I put a little blob on each of the uh, wheels and um, then that tends to help. Also, uh, I let the trains warm up a bit at an exhibition because uh, they don't like coming in from the cold and then being asked to work straight away. So um, they require a little bit of coaxing, but it may just be me not maintaining things as well as other people. Uh, some of the drawbacks is not a perfect scale. When you reach this size, you, know, you do end up with some issues. So again, you need very steady hands and good eyesight. Um, so this isn't good for people whose eyesight might be... Um, not uh, as great as possible. Um, there's a, currently a lack of any motorized units apart from Bobo chassis. Uh, some people have made side frames for, for bogies so that you can have a Coco diesel, um, but the, there isn't really anything else that's ready to run uh, apart from the Class 08 diesel when it comes out, which will be nice and could lead to some other uh, variations like having 060 steam locos and such. Um, the points and uh, slash switches, um, they could do with some improvement. They don't look great and they don't run great. They've got a fair bit of dead section in them. Um, and despite everything, there still isn't a huge amount of rolling stock available for any um, area or, or era. And um, can't do any switching or shunting because the couplings are absolutely minuscule. Uh, they use the same sort of um, grabby hook type couplings that you get in N-Gage, but uh, scaled down um, and they are quite tight. Um, and I wouldn't want to try and undo one. And um, you can have a bit of pickup issues as well. It is, not for the faint-hearted, but in big text at the bottom there, I would still highly recommend it that anyone who's interested with it have a try because it has, it's been very interesting for me working in T-Gage and uh, I'm glad I did it because it, it's been really different compared to um, other scales uh, and the, the things you can do in it are quite immense. Um, so I've got... I think it was about a mile of track in my guitar case, despite the fact it's only a four foot long guitar. So um, I've taken, uh, how long have I taken? About 40 minutes. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Am I still connected? Can anyone still hear me? Yeah, he's still with us. There are a few questions <laughs> um, in the on the live stream that we'll get to. Um, so uh, the first one is that... Um, Thomas asks, he's seen T-scale drive mechanisms and trucks and couples on tgauge.com, but are there any other sites that sell uh, T-scale drive mechanisms? Um, yes, I think there's an American site that sells the drive mechanisms and there's one in Australia. Um, I think they just buy them off of the T-gauge people themselves anyway. 
Um, so you're not going to get much variation in price, unfortunately. Um, but they're, they're only about 38 quid uh, per chassis. But yeah, it's pretty much just tgauge.com. Uh, there is another shop in the UK that uh, sells them. Uh, and the, the name eludes me at the moment. Cool. Um, another question from uh, Thomas Gazier in uh, Minnesota. That's Thomas Gazier, MMR. Sorry, Tom. Uh, he asks cost of equipment, roughly. Um, yes, yeah, so it's uh, not that expensive. Um, the like I just said, the the standard um, uh, chassis that you can uh, do it yourself and put three D printed bodies on they cost um, about thirty eight pounds. Um, not quite sure what that is, is in dollars, um, and the track is not too bad so you can get um i think it's meter lengths for uh i think it's something like four quid um and that's of the the flex track um the set track is comparable to other scales i'd say still more well, it's cheaper than, than ho track definitely and the controllers um because they use pulse width modulation they're a little bit more expensive uh, and they also have that uh, automatic stop and start function to them. They cost about forty pounds. Um, but I, I've made a controller with parts off of Amazon for um, about ten quid, ten pounds, um, because all you need is a, a five volt pulse width modulation um, power supply and a, a flick switch for direction, basically. Uh, the rolling stock. Forget, forgetting the ready run, ready to run locos, um, the full length um, class forty three HST that is about one hundred and eighty quid. Um, but the uh, individual diesels and stuff they are about seventy to eighty quid, I think. And um, I know they're very small, but the detail on them is absolutely spectacular. So uh, on the the HST diesel units, they actually have um, all the writings legible on them, and they have the, the numbers on the end of the diesels, which uh, are, are readable too. And um, even where it's got the guard door on it, it says guard, and you can read it with a magnifying glass. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's cheaper than... And other scales, I guess. But if you want to do a big area, then you've got to start thinking about how many uh, how many trees you're going to need uh, and that sort of thing. Because uh, with the increased uh, geographic area, you can end up with a lot of houses and trees. And that's where costs might go up a bit. Okay, we've got more questions from the stream. I'm sure there's probably questions in the in the chat i know uh, andy ambrose is keen now to rip his layout out and redo it in t-gauge um, <laughs> so uh thomas uh catalano thomas gazier another thomas uh, asks um how long of a train could you typically run with a single drive unit if you were to have a long freight train say 30 cars how many drive units Ooh. would you need to include have you ever run anything that yeah. big um i haven't run anything that big um i know that Typically, you want um, you want quite a few drive units. Uh, running just one diesel, I wouldn't recommend. Um, so, if you're doing uh, American, then you could easily have a, a consist of like two or three diesels, and it wouldn't look out of place. And then you could probably pull quite a few wagons with it. But um, for instance, the the HST that has three motors in it to, to keep it going because when you get to this small they're not very powerful and they've got the resistance of the magnetic wheels that they're working against as well um, so it's a lot better when you've got a passenger train because you have motors in the coaches and stuff but for a freight train you probably want two or three diesels to to have a reasonable length train thanks Michael we're good we're there's more questions yet. Don't worry. <laughs> you have you have a fan club as well. And if you know uh, a lady by the name of Sarah Miller, but she's definitely a fan. Um, That's and, my wife. Is that your wife? <laughs> there we go. She's definitely a fan. But there's also another person who is 
<laughs> I don't know who it is, but it's Twiggy Love sixty. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but you've got a second fan up there as well. Um, so Thomas Gazier MMR asks, um, uh, yeah, can we can we yeah we can change this yeah stop sharing there, Michael and we, we can see yeah. you answering in your in your train shed. Um, yeah, sure. Brad, thanks. That's good. No. I can show I can show something else off that uh, I prepared as well. Right. Here. So this is what I think is probably the smallest footprint of a layout you could have in T-Gage. So this is a cigar case uh, with a, three AAA batteries and a tiny, tiny little pulse width modulation power supply running a single class uh, 37 diesel, I think it is. And it's a little bit fast there, but um, so this is a 60 min uh, 60 millimeter radius set of corners uh, that you can get that's pre-bent flex track so um that's practically about the smallest that you can get unless you did it in a pure circle cool anyway back to, yeah, back, back to questions <laughs> before we land you getting divorced here so um Okay, Tom Tom Gage MMA asks, are there are there any T gauge clubs or modular groups or modular standards such as like Fremo T track? <laughs> uh no, unfortunately. There's just not enough people, I think. Um and when it comes to joining up different modular sections, I think that would be quite a difficulty. Uh so most people tend to have a single baseboard rather than trying to have different modules that they attach together. Uh, just because trying to align track that is that fine uh, could be a bit of a headache. <laughs> and um, uh, Thomas Catalano again. Uh, you've seen 3D prints of North American prototype locos and rolling stock from CEE models or C models. It's like C, capital C, capital E, capital E models. Um, his diesels have long codes that are too narrow for the drive mechanisms. So they run as dummies with power units in the freight cars. Are there any issues with these dummy locos staying on the track, or do the magnetic wheels keep them in place? Um, it's The magnetic wheels actually uh, work really well. So um, I actually have uh, an 060 switcher, uh, switcher, wrong country, an 060 um, steam loco, which I appear to have left in, oh no, there it is. So sometimes I run two powered coaches with uh, this tiny little 060 at the front uh, pretending to pull them and it just has uh, a couple of magnetic wheels with a non-magnetic one in the middle uh, I should say magnetic sets of wheels and uh, yeah pushing uh, a non-powered unit isn't a, a problem at all awesome and uh <laughs> Right, that's going to be the final question from the uh, from the stream. Uh, Brad in Australia says T gauge remote operation. Uh, he expects me to organise that from next year. Right, okay. <laughs> I don't think so somehow. Well, DCC, so technically it's possible. Um, and uh, Thomas Catalano says uh, that your cigar layout is absolutely awesome. Cigar box layout. Thanks. <laughs> no uh, scenery in it yet, though. Uh, <laughs> tomorrow. Um, so. Andy's asked a lot of questions. I think you answered the question about minimum radius earlier. Um, but um, he, he says um, that potentially suggests that fast tracks um, who make the assembly fixtures should uh, should make T-scale switches so you can scratch build your own T-scale switch. I have actually seen pictures of someone uh, someone's switches that they have hand built and fully work in t-gauge um i don't know if they used a jig but um there are crazy people out there that will try and make anything in t-gauge and uh, andy questioned uh, who exactly was able to read uh, the guard lettering on the side of the, <laughs> the coach. Um, i can with a magnifying glass <laughs> yeah as we said before we went on air um a digital microscope is your friend um <laughs> And then a uh, final question that I have um, in the in the chat here in where in um, Webex, uh, what rail does uh, what rail code does T gauge use? Uh, it uses code forty five rail, so it's not exactly fine scale, but there's just the limitations of working that small. 
I see on the I see on the tgauge.com website that you they sell Code 40 rail, bullhead. Oh, rail. Okay. Slightly um, wrong then, sorry. Well, no, 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 <laughs> no, as, as a separate rail um, without any um, without any sleepers or anything that are separate from that. So I'm guessing that there are people who are attempting to scratch build some stuff in this scale. Um, but it's steel rail as opposed to nickel silver or or brass, I guess, yeah. the magnetic wheels. Yeah, so everything's in steel rail, uh, again, yeah, for the, the magnetic wheels. Um, so it, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. I've not had any problems with uh, the rails rusting or anything because the amount you have to keep the track clean anyway, um, it's not an issue. Um, so thank you very, very much. That was an absolutely fantastic uh, introduction to T-Gauge for folk, and uh, hopefully that's piqued a few people's interest i'm not seeing any other hands up and i'm not seeing any questions we'll we'll ask in the webex is there anybody who's got a question for michael I'm not seeing that at the moment so i'm just gonna our next presentation for those watching the live stream will start in about 10 minutes i'm just gonna uh transition you over to our uh holding pattern slides uh, so you can enjoy those and check out some of the schedule for nmrx that's coming up in the near future and uh, we'll be right back at uh, the bottom of the hour.
Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, sorry, we just had a few uh, little technical glitches there at my side in Orkney. Um, we should all be back on, and uh, everyone should be with us. Uh, thank you for being patient. Uh, last clinic tonight is by uh, our regional vice president, Jonathan Small, um, who is going to give uh, his clinic um, regarding how he developed his uh, his own uh, design for his own layout um, from other, from. Yeah, someone else's chat. <laughs> I should just shut up and let you speak, Jonathan, because I'm I am done. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up and just hand it over to Jonathan. It's just for the best for everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Gordy. Good evening, everybody. Uh, both on on PowerPoint and uh, not PowerPoint on um, WebEx and and on Facebook and YouTube, wherever in the world you're watching. It's it's wonderful to be with you. Um, I was very, very fortunate. Um, I went to a school um, in Ilford, Essex. The headmaster was Cliff Young, though we boys all used to call him Frank because his initials were FC. Um, and uh, he learned that uh, I had an interest in model railways and invited me when I was a senior student at the school to come and operate his layout. Now, I know one or two of my colleagues in the NMRA here um, know of this layout, so I'm hoping that they'll correct me if I get anything wrong. Um, Anyway, without further ado, welcome to Cliff Young's Denver and Rio Grande Western. Uh, it was a fabulous layout, as I say, you can see my captions on the left. Um, these pictures were, uh, somebody, uh, a friend handed me a photocopy of a, of a railway modeler article um, some years after I'd moved away from London, I think it was in the early 80s. And, and miraculously, there must have, somebody must have known that I, I had seen this layout and handed me this, this copy of this article which I've kept, I've treasured it. It's got all kinds of graffiti on it from where I've studied it. Um, but these are the photographs which I scanned to the highest quality that I could by, by uh, a gentleman called Philip Kelly. Um, and this was Cliff's layout. Um, this was his Den Denver station and yard. And you can see the, tr the tracks climbing up uh, as they went around the room. The layout was in a room 21 feet by eight above the garage in his house uh, in Loughton, Essex. Um, you went up the straight stairway, through a sliding door to the left and ducked under, and you suddenly came up surrounded by the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. Um, and he represented the railway by climbing around the room three times from Denver up to a, a height at the top point. He had a representation, a very simple representation of the Moffat Tunnel West uh, East Portal, of course. And then the, there was a long tunnel through which the trains would descend and come back round um, and arrive at a, a point called Western Yard. He built the layout himself. I think it was his second layout because he refers in the article to having built a previous one. And he recycled all the track and built this one in just barely two years. And here's his track plan. Um, here at the bottom, this was the sliding door. You came up the stairs here and ducked under this little section would lift out um, for, to save you having to duck when it wasn't in operation. You could get into this little place here to do uh, switching for the CBQ interchange and uh, industries at Denver. And we had Denver station and yard in this area. Um, we're facing north here, so that going out west is at this end and uh, east towards the city was, was around the track. There was a reversing track around under here or under the scenery so that you could come back out and turn trains around. The, the operation was incredibly simple. Um, you, a, a freight train would arrive, loco would cut off, run around the loop and reverse, go to the um, locomotive depart, depot. At the same time, the uh, switch engine would, come, would also come around and break the train up, put uh, way freight and through freight cars into the dispatch tracks or into the yard track at an ice platform. A transfer track, this was where cars would go to uh, CB&Q or to downtown, a caboose boost track. And that was really, that was really it. It was uh, a very simple to operate yard. And I just fell in love with it. And I, I graduated to being yard master on one or two of my later visits, um, which, uh, which I found fascinating. And, and it was hard work. It was proper pressure. You had trains, two or three trains arriving to be broken up during during the course of the session, and you had to do that work yourself. You didn't have a, a, somebody to do the switching. The yardmaster had to do that himself. So let's go on a tour of the line. Um, if we imagine we depart here at Utah Junction, uh, we follow around underneath on the ground level. These, these little numbers are all inches of climbing 
Um, you can see each square equals to in a spot height in inches starting from Denver. So climbing in inches above the level at Denver, we'd come out here. Uh, the first station is Leyden along here, which um, appears to be at the same level. It's very, very slightly higher. And um, the Grants Mill, I do have photos I'll show you late as, as we go through, but I just want to take you on a tour around the layout first. Climbing has Leyden. We had a long passing siding, Ace Tool Company with a switching. And you move that there, that's it. Um, and a coal mine, then we go into a little tunnel here. Now we're three and a half inches up. And we go past Dow Plastics, in fact, round the back. Dow Chemical is, is up on the, the, on the plains above Denver, isn't it, up towards the mountains. Um, and then we come out at Rocky, Rocky Flat, where there was a, a switch that would take you back to Dow Plastics. That was an interesting one to, to work with. Still climbing, four inches, five inches going round to Plainview. These are all locations in, in the, for those who know the line, they're all real locations, real names taken from places up above um, Denver going into the mountains. Though I think they're not quite as busy railroad locations as, as Cliff had you uh, operate them on his layout. Seven, uh, six inches, then we're going to this tunnel C, which reappears here at Crescent. Just a short stop with a short spur, still climbing round on the third level now, going across above Rocky to Pine Cliff, where we had a, a long passing siding and a second siding here for, let's say, setting cars out. Uh, very useful siding for trains passing, of course, which we would offering regularly have meets. Um, and then still climbing almost at the highest point now going along the, the highest point at the back to Tolland. Interesting track layout here, a little switch back to the, 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 the depot there. Another passing siding. And here is East Portal, nine and a half inches up from Denver, then into the Moffat Tunnel. Where's my mouse gone? There it is. Disappearing all the way down the back, the Moffat Tunnel, and finally coming back out at into Western Yard, which represented any point to the west of, of well, of the Rocky Mountains of, of Moffat Tunnel. Turntable, because Cliff ran a lot of steam locomotives. And again, passenger track, um, freight arrival, through freight, way freight, very little, um, you know, that he needed there. He had everything that, that, that made the thing work. And interestingly, there was a cut off back to Leyden for continuous running, which would cut out both Western Yard and Denver for um, for exhibitions and, and to show visitors or, or children or anything that he, in, in proper operation, he would set out spare cars on that track. So that, that was really it. And so let's, let's go on that journey again, this time with a few pictures to show you um, where we were. Here we are at Denver. This is the train as the prospector, having just arrived from, from the west. You see, we see the yard tracks, the, the transfer track, and we can catch a glimpse of how Cliff used to run the layout. Remember, this was the late 60s, early 70s. No digital stuff in those days. These are Hamilton Morgan control cabs with uh, double pole, double throw toggles. There were two control cabs, A and B. You could take any, any of the dozen or so sections and assign them to one of the two main cabs. And for local switching, there were local cabs with a switch just to drop that section out of the main line for as long as you needed it. There's a lot of beautiful carpentry he'd done with um, veneer frontage to make everything look very neat and tidy. It was beautifully built into the room. But the scenery was very simple. Here at the lower photo, we can see um, the scenery consisted largely of flat hardboard um, or plywood, possibly, I don't know what they were, profile boards, absolutely vertical, smeared with plaster, made to look rocky and painted brown. And that was pretty much it. Um, it meant he could get a lot more track into each area. If you have a look here, these are part of the city track, straight cliff right the way up, and that's probably rocky up there, directly above Denver. <coughs> Excuse me. A few trees and things which um, did make things interesting. Of course, we were in an arid part of the world in, in, in Colorado, as we know, um, the Denver Station. And here up in the distance, this is the Eureka Mine. Uh, he had a, had a mine branch because he just liked the idea and wanted to have one. Um, and that, that was the highest layout, location on the layout physically. It was only about barely a foot above Denver, but that was the highest point. No helixes in those days. The um, beautiful backdrops were all painted by. Um, a gentleman called Bernard Myers, who obviously did the job for Cliff. And again, it was just painted on flat board, but looked beautifully realistic. You know, you were never aware that, it was, that the whole layout was kind of two-dimensional in that way. It was really very captivating to be, be there and operate. So leaving Denver to the west, this is Utah Junction, the big rocky tunnel mouth. And again, we can see some of the, the, the operating equipment down here, uh, the Denver switcher, 
couple of locomotives in the um, in the MPD. This Eureka Mine. That's about the only view we'll get of it up there. And uh, up here, I think this is Pine Cliff. Well, that's maybe that's Tollum. Anyway, we will come to it. A little close up of the track plan. You can see where we are on the layout. Now we go round round to Leyden. This is this area here it is going across where the the sliding store, excuse me, sliding door space was. These cracks or these this, these joints obviously were much less visible in real life than they are in the photo. Funnily enough, um, and then Cliff has a grant, his milling company that he built. I think perhaps he, as David McLaughlin says, bury your structures. He could, could have done with a little bit more filler at the bottom of that one by the look of it, but it was a beautiful structure and great fun to operate there. The tracks here are, uh, this is Leyden, and then tracks at Western Yard in the front. You had this, this strange thing where um, the, these tracks were, were one location, the tracks immediately behind, as you see here, were somewhere else, and yet they, would, they, they were right next to each other in real life, but they would have the feeling of being dozens of miles apart when you were operating the layout. That was a concept that I kept very much in mind when I was designing my layout. Um, looking another view of the same area, this is the, the stub tracks of Western Yard. So this is literally the very western end of the railway. And these are the tracks at, at um, Leyden with a very familiar looking uh, kit station building there. Uh, you see what I mean about the cliff straight the way up. And that's the California Zephyr literally at Tolland, almost in the Moffat Tunnel. So that's the vertical extent of the layout that we see in full right there. A um, little further west, we see um, Ace Tool Plant being switched at Leyden and a way freight arriving at Tolland on the upper level. Now we've come once round, one once completely round the room. We're back at back, sort of at Denver, except we're above. We're up here now. Uh, this is Rocky. And this is the main line coming up from Leyden. And if we turn, go through the turnout and come out here, we will back reverse into Dow, the chemical plant. And these are cars at the city tracks that I referred to before. This is the reverse loop coming through from the other side of the station, behind the station, and then you can reverse from there into these, to the tracks here, to the city tracks. On the higher level, the way freight approaching Pine Cliff, and this right here, this is the Moffat Tunnel. At the very highest point of the layout. In a similar position, a little further, we say the same sorts of area of the layout. This is Western Yard in the front, uh, just a brick wall now, and a freight train arriving plain view. Um, with the California Zephyr up at Pine Cliff. We see how it's almost in terraces, isn't it? It's with, there are sections where the layout would be climbing and other sections where it would almost appear to be a little bit like, like uh, I was reminded of this when I went through Gushenen in the Alps, where you'd, you'd go through all the tunnels and then half an hour later, you'd just be higher up the same mountainside seeing the track you'd gone along half an hour before. I think my captions more or less tell you what, what you need to know about these photos. This 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 is the, the line going up to the Re Eureka Mine from Plain View here and Pine Cliff just here. So they're really very close together, just a couple of inches apart, and yet a whole circuit of the room to get from one to the other. Incidentally, all the 60 or 70 turnouts on that, they're all controlled by little throw hand throws like this physically. There were no almost no electric point motors on the layout at all. Again, we can see here from a higher point of view, that's the Utah Junction, the Rocky Tunnel Portal, plain view to the track going to plain view, and then Pine Cliff on the upper level. This, I remember this engine, 3367. I remember operating that one. I had a lot of fun with it. I'd never seen a, a compound locomotive like this with two sets of driving wheels before I went to the cliff's layout, having been brought up on trying Hornby. And finally, uh, just at the highest point, the Moffat Tunnel. Very simplified, of course, the Moffat Tunnel is, is a vast structure. We, we saw it in Mike Arnold's talk earlier on. Um, I sort of had a rice smile when I saw that because I thought, well, Cliff Young's one wasn't as 
as grand as that, but it, it did its trick. It was a it was a grand portal for the layout, and um, he, he had a little spur here. It was a slight start to a downgrade, so he had to have a little point, one of those little ground throws with a bit of wire that you just put so that put put over the rail so that a, a freight car, free cunning freight free running freight car didn't <laughs> go off running down into the tunnel. And let's recap recapitulate to the Rocky and Dow Junction just here and then the that road leading to Pine Cliff. So that was the that was all those are literally all the photos that I have. I know there are others in other books and I have seen a few colour photos once or twice, but I don't have them to hand, I'm afraid. So how did this influence my design? Well, I wanted something rather similar. I was very influenced by um, this layout, obviously, but I also have a love for mainline railways running through mountainous scenery. It's just a thing that, I, that appeals to me. I always enjoy when I drive up to Scotland, going through, uh, coincidentally, Moffat, the pass at Moffat on the A74, and seeing the, the railway lines and the high highest part of the mountains there and, and, and love to see trains going through the, the curving bank lines and the, the tight um, river valleys. So I wanted a line rising from plains into mountains leading to a major tunnel. Several small towns along the way for freight switching, opportunity to build motors and scenery. I and mean, you can see what I've written for you here. The way I, I found the way Cliff's Denver Yard operated, as I say, to be very logical and enjoyable. I didn't know as much as, as uh, as I've later had the opportunity to learn about how freight yards work with, you know, um, arrival yards and departure yards. And of course, these things can be vast. I mean, if we think about Minot, uh, the, the um, Gavin Yard that the Great Northern built um, on the plains of North Dakota was colossal. It was the size of a small town or even a large town. But I found this yard very, very useful on a model and very helpful and intuitive to use. And you could see how the freight cars were, trains would come in and be reclassified and redirected to go back out again. I'm, I'm not going to talk about Cliff's operating system this evening. He used very briefly the um, card and waybill system, uh, which I've replicated on my own layout. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. If you're not, have a look and, and see what you can. It, it's a wonderful way to uh, to run trains, and in, mainly from the days before computers, because these days we have computer-generated switch lists and all the rest of it. But the card and waybill takes a few minutes to set up, but it's well worth and it's great fun. And I really enjoyed it. Um, my room had some challenges. At, at the top of my house, it was two originally two small bedrooms with sloping roofs because it's up under the uh, at the top of the house. And so it, around the room, as the way that Cliff had done, wasn't possible for me. I had a desk and my workbench and all sorts of other things. So as you see on the lower paragraph, I explain what my rationale. Those of you who know anything about me at all know I'm a great northern fan and I've built millions of trees for my layout and all the rest of it. We talked about that earlier in the year. So here is the first plan I came up with in 1986 for the layout. And you'll see some similarities. Here is the yard that I call Snohomish. I didn't feel I had the courage to try and represent Seattle. Um, I start, decided to start just in land with a town that I enlarged bigger than it actually is in real life, uh, and, but a, a decent point from which to originate the trains. And my, my snow yard is literally cliffs reversed. Um, it's a mirror image. His went off to the west, mine goes off to the east. Slightly larger locomotive depot. Again, similar situation here with, a, this is caboose track. Um, drill track, a reverse loop under the Wedding Cake Mountain here that comes out there. An oil tank and uh, a track for oil tanks, and then we leave to the east. This is the this is the, the layout as it was as uh, 1986 to 94 when I then expanded it. So we went through this tunnel here, the Snowmish Tunnel, under what was then a mountain. The blue lines, by the way, are skyboards that went up to a height to above eye height so that you couldn't, for scenic, you know, for scenic blocks. And through Munro, uh, across the river. Interestingly, Cliff's layout had not, did not have a single water course. Um, I didn't realize at the time, you didn't kind of miss it somehow, but now I look back on it from my own experience and I remember that he, there, wasn't, there were no water courses anywhere. There were bridges, but no water courses. Across the river, through a little tunnel underneath here, around, past through Sultan, across the river again, a little spur at, low, at, at Gold Bar. Now, my datum heights are centimetres, not inches, but, I mean, they, they're there to illustrate. Um, four, then six, along through here, through another little tunnel, past the yard. Index, again, a, a single spur track. 
through another little tunnel, lots of lots of short, lots of small tunnels <laughs> along this section of track here. Now we're 10 centimeters or four inches above Snohomish Yard. Then we have a, a, a switch. And at this point, I wanted a cutoff for continuous run as well. The mine had to be a bit more convoluted than Chris. So I added was it went round here, now descending. You can see where it says C, and it came back out there. So then you're back at the beginning, and that's we still have that to this day. And it's 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 a great way to run trains in and set something running. And you can operate on quite a lot of the rest of the layout, including Snowmish Yard itself, even when that is in use. From here, we then take this track, and now we're climbing back up again. This was fun to build, lots of um, jigsaw and plywood. To this station, this location was originally called Sky Comish. You'll see that the names have changed on the later plan, but don't worry too much about that. That, that location is still there, it's just got a different name. <laughs> and from here, again, I wanted a branch, so we took a final turn around the mountain. This is quite a steep climb across a bridge and all the way across to the end there. This location is now named Medicine Lake and it's uh, sort of you know, originates lumber, um, which I supply logs to my sawmill at um, Winton, which you'll see later. Oh, no, what have I done? Here we are. So that's Medicine Lake. Then continuing east, climbing all the time, another little spur track through here, another tunnel to this location, which was then called Scenic. The track plan here has changed but the, the, a little bit, but the, the town is very much still there. Small mo locomotive depot. High bridge above the gorge. This is about 10, 11 inches around this. This is a tight bit of track. It's not as bad as it looks. Um, full length passenger cars can get around it without any problem at low speeds, of course. We are in the mountains after all. High trestle bridge around on a rocky ledge. And then we went into what was then the Cascade Tunnel. Three turns descending and coming out into my eastern yard, which I call Cascade Yard. Similar track plan to cliffs, again, freight dispatch tracks, a thoroughfare, run around track, turntable, diesels, and a couple of industrial tracks at the front. Um, there were some problems with this design. It worked very well up to a point, but the first thing was that when you headed into here with a passenger train, you were stuck. You had to find a way to turn the thing around, and it was very complicated, whatever you did. In Cliff's case, of course, he had his cutoff track, and he could just reverse, he could pull it around the, the cutoff track back to Denver, run around the loop, and and restaged the train at Western Yard, ready for an, an east uh, an eastbound run. And of course, he would he would make sure that in an operating session, he never needed to do that. So that was one problem. Um, a few similarities here, and some here's some more of the challenges cascading. I wanted a longer mainline run to climb further into the mountains. So my revised plan, which I was able to draw up having been to Stevens Pass for the first time in 1993 and on a trip on the Empire Builder, is as follows. Um, these next drawings aren't quite as detailed in terms of topography, but you can at least see where the tracks are. So everything is on this side of the layout is more or less the same. Nothing really changed very much. Uh, we have Snowmish Yard, we have the turnaround, we have all these tracks are all still exactly the same. The names have changed a little bit. This is now Bearing. Oh, sorry. This is now Bearing, Medicine Lake, as I said. We go through the same tunnel. We don't come out at Munro as before. Now, when we get round here, I've added a new line. This is the old line, actually. <laughs> I call this the old line, but it is actually, in fact, this was new. Uh, so Goldbar is now a little town instead of just being a spur track here. I found these stub end spurs would be um, unexpectedly frustrating because they would block the, the main line while you were switching there and at index and also this one up here. So we've by bypassed Goldbar and index completely. These are now separate towns and we have a run around main line. This is the, the actual main line that we use for, for, for through trains, passenger and freight. And it rejoins here and we've called this line Writer, um, which is after a location, then Halford. Um, cutoff is still there around and now we come to Bearing with again the track going back to Medicine Lake. Bering took these tunnels away here, and we now have Grotto, which the, during lockdown, I've actually added a track in here for to lengthen the set out possibilities, and, and a, you'll see there might be a photo of that later on. This is now called Grotto, which is another real, can't even call it a town, it's a settlement just to the west of Skycomish. And this is now Skycomish here. Remember that used to be over there, it's now here, and Scenic is around this side. Skycomish with again slightly changed 
track uh, for formation um, around the same way. Now, instead of here, where the old tunnel used to drop down, we now continue climbing. We go through scenic, where I sought to replicate the track layout exactly as it wa was, or well, still is, in the real scenic. And we enter Cascade Tunnel at the West Portal here. We're now 20 centimeters above Snohomish, and we go into this helix, which climbs five times and comes out on the upper deck. Now, the upper deck, um, this is the East Portal at Burn, which those of you who've, who've kindly watched my talks about tree making, you've seen an inordinate number of pictures of that with all the forest and mountains up behind it. Um, and here's Burn. Again, with a long passing siding around through the Little Gainer Tunnel, across the river at, at White Pines to Merritt. And I've also brought the Winton Sawmill in here, which is where all those logs go. Um, and th this, I've, I've kind of compressed Winton and Merritt into one location. And then we go back into the tunnel again and come down. And on the second turn down, there's a turnout where the whole upper deck joins. And so that, the, in other words, the upper deck is a return loop. And then also, as we go down, there's a holding track on levels one to three. So you can stage tracks uh, on the, uh, in, in the tunnel, and they can reappear at Merritt as if they've come from somewhere on the east. So that's the, upper, the upper deck sits, as you can see. You know, if you can imagine where that, that is, it's, it's exactly the same part of the layout that sits above the, um, the, the main part. There's a few, few pictures to take you on a quick tour. You'll have to excuse all the tools and lights and stuff. These were snapshots taken during works. Clearly, the builders haven't finished the, what they're doing at Snohomish at the moment. So this is the yard, passenger station, um, the, the freight tracks, the MPD, um, index in the corner here. Sorry, the lighting isn't all that good. This is Grotto, tucked in there. And this is here's Medicine Lake under Mount Index, which is painted on the wall. This area is still to be, there's a train waiting there on the cutoff. I can use that as a holding track. And then the next picture, Similar shot, looking into the end of the layout. This is Gold Bar here on the right with all the work going on. Scenic here, the light, layout lights aren't on in this picture, I'm afraid. This is Scenic with the um, West Portal. The Sawmill at Winton, and this is Merritt up here. And we can see here, this is the writer line on the far side of the river, the, the bridge at um, Gold Bar coming around through Index, and then they rejoin there. And finally, on the other side of the layout, the upper deck is a representation of a big mountain. Here's Burn, the, the Cascade Tunnel portal. This is location at Burn. Sky Comish down here with an extraneous building standing on the tracks for some reason. Again, it was a workshop during lockdown. <laughs> uh, and Munro at the bottom. And now a few pictures um, that I've just taken that I thought you might like to see of, of parts of the layout I've worked on during lockdown. This is the new, completely new location of Grotto. Um, all that there used to be was this loader, uh, but now we've got the stub track in here so we can set out oil cars and things, oil tanks, um, um, a slightly dubious hotel right by the main line. And at Gold Bar, um, the Harris Feed Mill, uh, the Harrises were a lovely family that welcomed me and my father-in-law and put us up for several days when we went to stay in 1993. So I named an industry after them. Um, they now sell all sorts of uh, grain and feed products. So they never knew they were going to do that. And we have a kind of little sort of ramshackle oil industry here. That that um, Christmas tree ornament of a of a cab has now of a, of a of a house has now been light proofed. <laughs> it doesn't glow quite so bright red. And on the upper deck, um, actually, this isn't the upper deck over here on the left. This is uh, a, the fruit special freight train coming through scenic, with some SD forty fives on the point. And on the other picture, this is a GP30 helper engine returning to Merritt on the Cascade Tunnel. This this area, this is an eye level for me. I'm six foot. That's eye level. So it's quite high up in the room, as you can see. So just a final few final things. Um, the upper part's largely unchanged, although so I adjusted the location name, Sky Commission River added again. I was just describing what I've already showed you that I did add the upper deck. This is just a few notes. So yeah, the original plan bore the closest resemblance to Cliffs Rio Grande. Um, I learned, I've learned a lot since, mainly from my colleagues and friends in the NMRA, 
in the last 30 or 40 years too. I mean, I'm incredibly grateful. I can't tell you all how, much, how valuable it's been to learn from, from everyone so many techniques and ideas for, for the layout. Uh, adding the double decking, which I really enjoyed. You know, the idea of having this curved sky boards was one I went in, I think it was 1986, very early in my American modeling career, went to Washington where my wife comes from. We went to visit a gentleman called Rick Shoup, who built a fantastic representation of the East Broad Top, and it was a kind of W-shaped layout, and he had curved sky boards breaking up the scenes. I thought, what a fantastic idea. And I came straight home and added one to my layout. <laughs> Hence uh, what I say about learning from colleagues in the NMRA. Um, so really, that's, uh, that, that's it. Uh, any questions? I'm happy to take any questions that you have. I hope you found it useful and interesting. I'm sure you all have layouts, legendary layouts that we, we've all learned from over the years. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, we have got some questions from the stream. Um, uh, one question was the first layout. Uh, what what scale was was that? Oh, Cliff's layout was HO. Layout. Yeah, HO. And yeah. your layout for everyone is N scale. It is indeed. Yes, yes. I should have made that clear. That's okay. That's fine. And questions in our chat here in WebEx. Uh, why? Uh, Mike asks, why did you choose Stevens Pass? Um. I just love the scenery. It kind of reminds me a little bit, as you'll know, Gordy, of the Scottish Highlands. Mm -hmm. All those trees and all those trees and mountains and rain, um, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and fantastic trains working incredibly hard. Plus, of course, in the old days, in the you know, they had the electric operation. Uh, I was just I don't know. I was just captivated by photos of the place, and having been there, even more so. It's just a beautiful location. You got to pick somewhere to model, haven't you? You can't, uh, you know. Some of us pick the plains of Wisconsin. Others pick Stevens Pass. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> don't everybody gives me grief for why did you pick an industrial part of Wisconsin <laughs> to model? If um, that's, that's, that's what floats your boat, then that's what you model, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, exactly. Um, mm. Dean, Dean's asked, how many people uh, uh, do you have at an operating session for your layout? Um, because of the size of the room, three or four is maximum. That's actually what Cliff used to have. Um, you know, four works well, and if, if I'm, with me being one of them to sort of... Um, dispatch and help out and keep out the way the rest of the time so yeah we, we've we've i've tried it with more but it's really just you know everyone get everyone's sort of waiting for everyone else so yeah three three or four me plus three that's cool okay thanks jonathan will everyone that's in the webex just stay uh stay put for just a second because i'm just gonna uh, just make a few announcements on the stream and then we'll, i'll keep the meeting open for british region members on here um so for everybody um tomorrow uh we are back with the British Region Convention at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, uh, 7 p.m. for folks in the U in the UK. Uh, we have a great clinic on the history of the British Region, the second region, only the second ever region of the NMRA. Um, been going for 75 years, just after World War II. And John Thurf, our archivist and historian, will be giving a presentation for about one and a half hours um, tomorrow. Uh, afternoon tomorrow evening uh, on the history of the British region how did uh, a North American or an American model railway organization uh, spread its uh, wings across the pond probably helped by uh, certain activities in the early 40s but anyway and uh, then all the good history of of different things that happened in our region uh, including holding hosting a national convention and uh, famous model railroaders such as John Allen becoming members of uh, of the British region. So uh, we hope you can all join us for that. Um, Jonathan, if you could just stop sharing, that would be that would be great. And uh, yeah, I'm trying. How do I okay. do that? Sorry. Oh, it's all right. We'll sort that out in a minute. And uh, but for everyone on the stream, we'll just kick you over to our uh, our slide deck for a few minutes, and we'll be killing the stream here shortly. But thank you for tuning in.